okay button. Now I've got it. Pause. Great. Um, but I'm just going to mute myself. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the goal setting meeting of the Board of Commissioners. Um, I will call us to order and do a quick round of introductions. I'm Zan Ogero, this year's chair. Uh, Pat Malone, Commissioner. Nancy. Good morning, Nancy Wise, Commissioner. Rick Krager, Chief Financial Officer. John Wire, Board of Commissioners. Vance Crony, County Council. Rachel McNenny, County Administrator. Okay, uh, and in the room, introductions. Welcome. Hi. 
Just the other the director of natural areas department of ethics. And online, um, we have uh, a couple of additional people. Jeff Van Arsdal, Benton County Sheriff. Tommy Douglas, Executive Director of Natural Areas, Parks and Events. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have no announcements. Does anyone else? I will move on then uh, to take a quick look at the agenda. I don't know of any changes at this point in time. So anyone else has any additions? Amendments? Okay, then we will approve the agenda as it is printed and move on to our new business. The first item is acceptance and purchase of the sale agreement for 4185 Southwest Research Way. Mike Krager. Thank you, Chair Ogero. Um, so today we come before you to uh, request authorization to enable the chair of the Board of Commissioners to enter into a purchase and sale agreement for the acquisition of the property at 4185 Southwest, Southwest Research Way. Real quick background for everyone, as, as you all recall, um, we entered on November 28th into a letter of intent to um, acquire this building for the purposes of our health department and children and family services. As part of that letter of agreement, we came uh, to understanding on the price um, at $3,795,000, but we also had a due diligence period in which we were to inspect the property, uh, review it to make sure that it was gonna continue to meet our needs. But more importantly, was there any infrastructure issues? Uh, we did have that property inspection done. And uh, for the most part, there were, you know, your minor issues, but there was one major area that uh, came to our um, awareness, which was around the HVAC system. And uh, it was giving, you know, some of the estimates we were hearing, I'm going to say roughly between two hundred three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, but maximum $300,000 price. Uh, went back to the county council uh, and used our, our real estate analyst to um, uh, go back to the seller and suggest that we might be credited for that. Uh, we proposed a $300,000 um, credit to our $3,795,000 offer. Uh, they uh, accepted a $200,000 credit, which puts us at a new price of $3,000,000. $595,000. That is what um, went into the purchase and sale agreement. That was not in your original packet. It, when we issued this last um, Thursday, Friday, we didn't know until Monday. I sent that out to all three of you yesterday so that you could see ultimately the only thing that was changed was the price. Is that correct, Vance? And so uh, that was what was in your email. So again, what we're asking for here today is, is um, the Board of Commissioners approval to authorize Zan to actually Commissioner Ogero to be able to uh, approve that purchase and sale agreement when the time comes. We are anticipating, at least our schedule right now would uh, suggest a closing around February 11th, but we think that that could happen faster. Um, and so um, next step will be um, to go through that closing process and uh, move towards uh, acquiring a new building. Will the closing process uh, require the uh, signature of the chair on all the paperwork? Yes, and that's that's why the motion is phrased as it is, so that we don't need to come back any further. And that when, if you're around, when I'm are you coming DC. back? Yeah, I'm in Washington D.C. until at least through the 14th, uh, most likely, uh, or maybe back on the 14th. It's not clear yet. So that's why I ask. Okay, so perhaps the motion should be phrase to allow the chair or the chair's absence, the vice chair. The vice chair will also be in DC. <laughs> <laughs> How about the remaining uh, commissioner and in, to allow any of the three commissioners to, to execute the documents necessary to uh, complete the transfer? That sounds like a good plan. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, we didn't realize it. Yeah, no, we sorry to be gone. Yeah. So we, uh, and, and I thank you for Commissioner Ojo for pointing out, I said to enter into a purchase and sell agreement, but the, the motion does say, and any other documents. Yes. So uh, it, uh, anything associated with that closing, but to Vance's point, I think getting approval, I guess, for any of the three uh, commissioners that are available to approve that yep. appropriate. 
And, and just one, one additional comment, the purchase and sale agreement that you have before you is, I would say 97% complete with the addition that uh, Rick sent to you yesterday. It's been sent to NURSA for its review. There, there could be a tweak or two, but nothing of any substance. Um, that's why you don't have the final document for approval. And then just one, one last reminder to the board as it relates to the actual financing uh, of this building. As I think all three of you know, we have a, a current request into uh, the state legislature uh, in relation to the acquisition of this building. Uh, we also have been approved to use a current capital grant that we have through the CHC approximately 614,000. So there will probably be some timing uh, between that, but uh, no need to worry. We can work through that. And as I explained to you before, there's some contingency plans in place. If things want to go exactly how we had planned in terms of uh, the state legislature. But I think we'll talk a little bit about that later with Zach when he comes. Thank you. Questions from my fellow commissioners? I don't, I don't think so. I, I just appreciate uh, how quickly this project has um, come before us and, and moved through the process in a um, timely manner. So, a lot of thanks to Vance. He's been great to help me also in the, uh, the process, along with our real estate analyst, uh, Gary Poole. So, thanks, Vance, for all of your guidance. Yeah, I throw a lot of a lot of props to uh, Gary Pond. Gary's been invaluable. Great. Okay. Well, I'm ready for a motion then. Uh, I move to authorize chair to enter into a purchase and sale agreement and any other documents necessary for the acquisition of property located at 4185 Southwest Research Way, which will be targeted for meeting space meeting the space needs for Benton County's children and family services and programs. Um, Can I make a friendly amendment to that and just change chair to any commissioner, any of the Benton County commissioners? Okay with that, Pat? Yes. Okay, uh, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion as amended, please signify with an aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on now to um, another property acquisition uh, project, uh, the acquisition agreement for the McBee Campground property. Uh, and that will also be- I know I'm listed, but I'm actually yes. going to uh, probably punt over to Vance to kick it off. And then Jesse will be here for any uh, questions. Yep. Um, so <laughs> as, as you know, this is the, the McBee acquisition. Um, We've gone through the LOI. You're aware of the of the process. The property has actually been conveyed from Hull Oaks to Afrana, and that that conveyance, um, which was the, the driver uh, for which was Hull Oaks' desire to have that property conveyed by the end of the uh, tax year 2023, that was accomplished. Um, the, the, the whole underlying um, purpose was for that property ultimately to become part of Benton County's park system uh, because we could not get things moving quickly enough. Afrana um, graciously offered to step in and be the intermediary to accept the property. So Hall Oaks transferred the property to Afrana at the end of 2023. What you have in front of you now is the acquisition agreement that sets out our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the property and Afrana. That includes things like Benton County responsible for the uh, insurance, Benton County responsible for access, main, uh, setting up any reservations um, that, that for folks who might want to use the campground. Um, basically, it puts us on track to become the owner when we have completed all of our steps necessary to acquire the property. And the acquisition agreement has a deadline for us to do that of July 1st, 2024. I, 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 it's reasonable to expect that the transfer will occur before July 1st, but that's, that's the time frame we built into the acquisition agreement. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a pretty straightforward document. Afrana has, has already agreed to this. So what you see is the, the final version. Um, Jesse, do you have anything you wanna add? 
Uh, no, we're, we're all set up right now for the AUS area. So we've got a gate and a kiosk and uh, instructions and warning signs and rules and coordinated with the uh, sheriff's deputies and everything that we need on our end. So uh, right now it's operating as a day hike. I'll just add that we do have everything tied up in terms of insurance. We are liability and we have a front listed as our additional insured on this. So everything's in place and I'll make sure that there's a copy of like that to our building insurance. And then to commemorate the uh, occasion, we wanted to give the commissioners a uh, copy of uh, the history of that kind of park system. Uh, I put Phil Hayes behind us here, park board uh, member on the front chair, and, and uh, just thank you to Afrana for helping us uh, with this acquisition. A huge array. Thank you very much to all of your members, and especially to the two of you. Yeah. Thanks to Tommy and Jesse and Jess. All of us. For the teamwork. Yeah. yeah, and of course it would not be possible without the Nystrom family. Alos. Thank you, everyone. Okay. okay. Sound of silent clapping online. <laughs> it's a golf clap. <laughs> okay. Um, I am then ready for a motion. Uh, I'll move to approve the acquisition agreement for the McBee campground property and authorize the chair to sign it and all other transfer documents related to the acquisition. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify with an aye. 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 Thank you. And, um, and again, this also carries forward when it comes time to actually sign the deed. The, the chair now has the authority to sign the deed yep. without coming back to the board. Great. Okay, moving on, and thank you for the books. I look forward to uh, I look forward to reading it. Uh, move, moving on to uh, item three point three, the Oregon Health Authority grant agreement. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm Chair. I've asked Karen to join me in case there are any questions. Um, First of all, we're here today to ask, uh, again, authorization to uh, enable the chair of the Board of the Commissioners to execute a grant agreement uh, with the Oregon Health Authority in the amount of $1,126,592.21. Uh, <laughs> that, that matches exactly uh, uh, the quote we have uh, for the purposes of this particular grant. but. Uh, Again, purposes of obviously is used to mitigate contaminated soil at the Bitten County Crisis Project, uh, Crisis Center Project. You all know that we identified some unanticipated issues. Um, Thanks to Damien and, and his quick work of uh, reaching out to the Oregon Health Authority, we were able to identify a opportunity. I, I, I say you know, a lot of people, would, we didn't actually apply for a grant in this case. It was kind of a, a request. There was money available and we said, hey, uh, we absolutely are, are willing to take. Um, so that, that's the purpose of, of this. Uh, normally we would not, because we did actually get this approved in the last budget supplement, we would not be bringing this forward, but there is a, a little bit of a unusual piece about this particular grant in that it actually has to be not only executed, but actually recorded against our property because there is a, a restricted use of the property. Having said that, I want to make, uh, first of all, give uh, Commissioner Wise absolute props for today for uh, catching a particular item in our packet on the restricted use. Uh, you might note that uh, it, it, it labeled that uh, there would be uh, restricted use of 16 beds in, in the crisis center, of which we don't have 16 beds. Uh, uh, I think that there was some confusion in terms of getting that straight with the Oregon Health Authority and council had suggested that that be up to 16 beds yes. to give us the flexibility. I think there's also maybe some questions in terms of the individual on that restricted use, actually who is served. Uh, but we're not asking for you to approve the grant agreement today. We're asking for the authority for the chair, since it will be recorded to prove it when it's ready. So I will say for to Commissioner Wise, uh, after this is over, Karen will be working with Damian and Ricky and April and probably Vance as well to make sure that that restricted use language is correct and meets our intention. But um, so that's, again, wanted to, to put that out there. Uh, 
Again, the grant uh, will be specifically for the quote that we got for the additional work out at the crisis center. Uh, you know that we've had that challenges as recently as, a, as another one, but everything right now is still within budget uh, as we speak. Um, and so this, uh, uh, once we are able to work through this issue with uh, the grant agreement, well, we will move to get Commissioner Ogero to sign off and get it notarized and then work with the James to get it recorded against uh, the property. So um, that's what we have before you today. Yes, so we'll just kind of tidy up some of the language there and um, focus on that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for catching that error. Yeah. And I think I read it and Im immediately um, read into it up to 16 beds, knowing that that's the regulatory threshold, but uh, oh. catch it. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think as Rick alluded to, it said there was some question in my mind about it says to serve individuals with an SUD who require treatment in a residential setting. And I just want to make sure, of course, our intent is to serve anyone that needs to have a that's having a mental health crisis, not just those that are uh, have an SUD. And I think the way it's written, it's written um, in, to include those that have an SUD diagnosis, but not exclusively. That's the way. Um, yeah. I don't know. When I read it, it says shall fill or hold vacant and available within the project 16 beds to serve individuals of SUD. Yeah, that needs to be clarified. Yeah. Is but the next 4.2.2 does clarify that it can be for new, you know, anyway, you guys will figure that all out. I am trusting that all of staff and that the chair will get this all ironed out. So I will vote yes. Thank you, Commissioner Wise. Appreciate it. Okay. Is there any further discussion? In Further questions about this agreement? Again, thank you to Damien for reaching out to our colleagues at the Oregon Health Authority and to the Oregon Health Authority for moving very quickly um, to meet our need. Um, motion? Uh, I'll move to authorize the chair of the Board of Commissioners to execute a grant agreement with the Oregon Health Authority for $1,126,592.21 to be used to mitigate contaminated soil at the Bend County Crisis Center project site, as well as any other documents related to the grant agreement. Second. All in favor, please signify with an aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, we'll move on now to a, what I think will be a fairly brief discussion of renewing our Housing Alliance um, membership. Um, and I believe that April uh, Holland is here partly uh, to help inform any of that uh, since uh, it's April's staff that have been primarily involved with the Housing Alliance. Um, but we received, or more, do you want to introduce this one? I can do it. Yeah, I'm certainly happy to. Uh, <clears throat> we received uh, an, an invoice uh, for, for two fiscal years, the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year uh, for uh, membership in the housing office for those two years. Typically, uh, all membership, organizational memberships come before the board for approval, including those uh, for renewal. And I think that in this case, there was staff turnover and uh, COVID issues, and they simply didn't fill anyone. So uh, we are facing uh, four years of renewal all at once, the two past years and, the two, and this biennial. So uh, that's where we are at this point in time. Um, and uh, we just wanted to bring it to, before the board for approval. The Housing Alliance gives us an opportunity to stay up to date um, on all of the housing legislation that's pending before the legislature and to get a feel for what the broader network of housing um, supporters um, and homelessness advocates um, are um, uh, advocating before the legislature. They also, uh, we have an opportunity at any time to um, uh, Put bills forward before the Housing Alliance and get support from that entire alliance for those uh, that legislation uh, at the legislature. So it gives us a little bit more leverage as well. Uh, so far, it's been a good opportunity. It's kept us much more um, informed about um, all of the housing and homelessness issues. 
and it's been a benefit to our 48th regional office. Um, so uh, I, I am in support of um, this membership. But I welcome input from my fellow commissioners and or a motion. Um, we're talking about two years here. I assume we've been a member of this group previously. Yes. Okay, so this is just a continuation. Yes. The reason we haven't heard about it for a while is they didn't do the billing. Okay. Uh, I'll move to uh, approve renewal of Benton County's membership in the Oregon Housing Alliance and authorize payment of membership dues in the amount of $750 each for fiscal years 2022, 23, and 23, 24 uh, for a total cost of uh, $1,500. Second. All in favor, please signify with an aye. 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 I thank you very much. We are zooming through our business. Um, we we'll move on now uh, to item 3.5. And I did send the Board of Commissioners um, and Rachel um, and Rick an update on this particular item. Um, I was recommending um, that with respect to Measure 110 uh, and the that is going to be um, a centerpiece of the short session of the legislature this year, uh, that we take a position uh, based on that taken by Lane County. Their staff uh, got together and uh, across all of the elements of the behavioral health and criminal justice system and came to a coordinated position uh, with respect to Measure 110 changes and funding needed for counties to be able to uh, better serve the population of folks with substance use disorders that become justice involved uh, that uh, measure 110 effects. Um, uh, that is included in your packet um, and those materials. Uh, I felt that the Lane County position was very well reasoned. It was a bit middle of the road and it was particularly good at addressing the county needs uh, related to this system. Uh, however, yes, at yesterday's association of Oregon County's uh, Joint Health and Human Services and Public Safety meeting, um, they took action on most of these recommendations and approved them. Um, and so there is a formal AOC position and I'm not sure how much more use it will be for us to take a position separately from that. So at this point, we could go ahead and uh, still support the Lane County position, which has a couple of nuances in it that the AOC position does not. Um, or we could just um, decide not to take a position on Measure 110 um, and, and, and wait a bit. It may well be that uh, as the discussion ripens at the legislature, um, a letter um, on some finer point of the negotiations that are occurring behind the scenes might be more strategic and timely. So um, at this point, I, I, I'm feeling that we probably should just hold off and uh, watch how things play out, especially given that uh, both Senator Gelser Blue and, and Speaker Rayfield occupy strategic seats when it comes to this measure. Uh, it, we may wanna save um, our input for a time when it is of critical importance. Commissioner Wise. Thank you. So I have a question. I uh, from your email yesterday, you said that I think you said AOC aligned with eight of uh, the eleven um, yep. policy recommendations yep. that LOC um, Association of Chiefs of Police, Oregon State Sheriffs Association, and Oregon District Attorneys Association all came together. Do you know which eight out of the eleven they uh, stood with, and why they did not? Uh, support the other ones? I do. Um, I will have to take a look um, to see if I can find it. Um, I thought I had it open here in, in, in front of me, but I do not. So if you'll give me just a second, I will um, open that up. Sure. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's okay. Um, and I probably have it all written down in my notebook. It might be an easier. Um, if you have the, um, 
LOC, um, Sheriff's Association, Chief of Police, and ODAA um, recommendations in front of you. AOC concurred with numbers four, seven, nine, 11, five, and six. And just read that again, please. Sorry. Four, seven, nine, 11, five, and six. And then additionally took action on uh, proposals eight and 10, but uh, to allow AOC staff to interact on those two with the, but to say that they were not ready for prime time. Those two recommendations were um, extending for the current 48 hour welfare hold up to 72 hours for a person that was intoxicated with alcohol or other substances um, and posing a danger to themselves or others. Um, and the there was a split opinion on that one, uh, partly because uh, that is not long enough for a person to stabilize and to detox. And so from a medical perspective, releasing someone at 72 hours might actually be more harmful to their health and, and more risky to others than releasing someone at 48 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there, there was a desire um, among um, AOC um, commissioners and um, the associated staff who were experts at this meeting to um, work with the legislature on that issue and not just automatically support that. And the other was uh, proposal 10, which recommended an uh, overdose quick response team capacity. There was some significant uh, concern about that one. That capacity would primarily be based within fire departments and um, emergency medical technician teams, but it duplicates um, what the legislature has just mandated, and that is the 24 seven crisis response teams in behavioral health. And there was a desire to avoid um, that kind of uh, a, a second rapid response team uh, set up uh, so quickly on top of the other when uh, we are already struggling to find staffing capacity for our uh, crisis response teams. Uh, even though the, the skill sets might be a little bit different, both teams would involve peer specialists and peer specialists are also in short um, supply right now. So. Um, there was a, a desire for a lot more discussion about that particular recommendation made by the League of Oregon Cities and Partners. So um, there was a very robust discussion at AOC yesterday, and and uh, perhaps Commissioner Malone, if you were at the Legislative Committee, you can comment on any comments, any further discussion that was held at that level. But uh, at the Joint Public Safety, Health, and Human Services uh, Committee meeting, the, the discussions were were, were good. <laughs> Uh, the discussion in the steering committee were referred to, but not in any um, detail. Any detail. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm okay with us holding off as long as we are, you know, remaining vigilant and looking for our chance to um, give our input and help move some of these along. Because I do support revamping measure 110 I think we all do um I just I want to note too the one about policy number four fund county probation departments you know if we support that I just want to make sure that we're being loud and clear about the funding and not just saying let us take on more work but not have the money to do it oh, absolutely I, I, that's a key position that everyone is fully in concurrence with um yeah, and I'm sure Sheriff Ben Arso agrees with that. No one wants any unfunded mandate, um, and it would be a significant amount of increased work um, for our parole and probation staff. Yeah, I, I'm fine uh, holding off uh, as long as our uh, elect, um, elected representatives know that we're in support of uh, revisions and, and um, somewhat relying on AOC to lead, lead the effort. I think that coming up, we'll be talking about calendar and about legislative breakfast, and we'll have opportunity um, to make it clear to our legislators before the session starts where we stand. Um, Sheriff, would you like to comment? 
I appreciate that, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness that's being put in with this. I, I would have just, I would agree, I think with the short, short session looming, it might be in the best interest just to hold off and, and maybe we can carry a little bit more water later on uh, and, and as they move into February and start proposing uh, legislation. I, I think that would be ideal. I, 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 as I've explained to you, I just want to make sure that the funding is there. Uh, if we, whatever, whatever we move forward with as it relates to Measure 110, we have to ensure that there's funding. So, thank you, um, Representative Lewis was in attendance at the joint meeting um, of the Public Safety and Health and Human Services uh, Steering Committees yesterday morning. Uh, he is intending to introduce an omnibus Measure 110 bill. So it was great to have him there at the meeting. He did not participate actively, but um, he was listening to the entire conversation. So I think that uh, the, the the conversations that are going on appear to be very productive at this point in time, and I'm I'm grateful to see that. I was also really grateful to hear that there was a consensus um, among AOC, AOC member commissioners uh, that has not been the case up until now. Uh, so this so this was a good discussion. Okay, okay. then we will move on to. Um, implementation of agenda to the agenda process. Uh, Mora. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to announce this item before you this morning. Uh, Again, it's going to be sharing a screen. Is that the screen that you want? Um, there should be just an Adobe PDF just on the single so that one right oh, there. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Um, so I introduced this briefly um, at leadership team last week, and it's in your packet and it's a technical difficulties with leadership team. But um, what I'm here to propose is that um, the board consider implementing an agenda to the agenda process. Um, as you know, we have we've had some challenges with getting uh, getting the packets out in a timely manner to both the commissioners for preparation and the public so that they uh, have significant advanced information about what the board will be discussing and acting on. So the purpose of this proposal is to at least implement uh, one solution that we hope will assist with that, um, and that is the implementation of the agenda. So our goal has always been to, to publish a completed agenda by close of business on the Wednesday before the Tuesday meeting. Um, we have had, you know, multiple occasions of issues that come up that have prohibited us from being able to do so. And many of these are externally driven. Um, we might get requests for letter of support. There are often financial issues that um, require timing from you know, outside sources. So we have a number of external deadlines that will often affect our ability to publish on time. Um, so this proposal would allow us to take, take all the information that we have on our agenda, publish at close of business, all of our standard business items, and publish at close of business on Wednesday before. This will give the commissioners and the public an opportunity to get started on the, the majority of the packet, do their preparation, give them time to develop questions, you know, consider your positions, et cetera. Then the addendum offers us an opportunity, anything that, that comes in after the deadline for the regular agenda um, with the county administrator approval would qualify for an addendum. And so the addendum is not the place for uh, necessarily, I just didn't get my submittal in on time. It's really, it's really, it should be sort of the exceptions where issues come up, where the board, you know, things the board needs to act quickly on with deadlines with a short time frame. So it allows us to get those on there, but not hold up the packet. I believe this will also address issues with uh, version control and allow you all to prepare, you know, have, have more time to prepare appropriately for the meetings. So I'm coming before you to ask you to approve implementation of the, um, of an, uh, an addendum process, and then I will work with the county administrator to set her procedures for uh, the approval process for what, what qualifies for the addendum. And then we would publish the addendum as you see Friday at 2 p.m. Um, 
you know, if something then comes up in the 24 hours prior to the meeting, we still have opportunities if we have to issue sort of like an emergency addendum. But this just gives us an opportunity to pick up those things that come in last minute without dragging the whole uh, meeting packet process. Just want to add for folks who may be watching this online or look at it later that laser fiches are a system that we use to um, put together our packets per week. So it's kind of an internal word that we use. But for folks who want to know how we, we track and put things together, the department department by department, and we will also probably do a press release on it as well. So we can uh, let all folks have plenty of time to know two things come out in one week. Well, I want to thank you um, for um, proposing an innovation to our current system. Uh, it definitely has not been working very well. Um, and I've been particularly concerned um, about being able to communicate well to um, our community members uh, about what agenda items are on um, the docket and um, conveying materials in, far enough in advance so people actually have time to absorb them and, and understand the issues. Um, so I, I really appreciate this suggestion that, that we'll get most of the material out um, in a much more timely fashion. Oh, yeah, I appreciate the effort and just trying to um, coordinate uh, receiving the information and then being able to get it out in a timely manner. And I know it's... Uh, Earlier last year, it was a bit of a struggle because things had slipped, and um, now we have pretty clear expectations. And, and as far as uh, uh, getting the information to, to you folks, and, and this, uh, I think this is a nice uh, you know, fine tuning of the process. Commissioner Wise. Yes, I'll just add my praise and thanks in there as well. This is definitely um, a step in the right direction, uh, considering transparency for the county. And um, yeah, I've been a commissioner for three years, and I'm not sure that a packet has ever come out on a Wednesday, by Wednesday. I don't know. Maybe I missed one, but um, nonetheless, I'm very happy that this um, process is moving forward. And a big thank you to Maura. Uh, we'd like to memorialize this with a motion. So I, if someone would be willing to make it, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I'll move to direct staff to implement the addendum to the agenda procedure effective with the February 6, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting. <clears throat> Second. All in favor signify with an aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. So Zach is in route, uh, so he was he was he was trying to get here before ten. So I don't know, Commissioner, if there is maybe a potential shift that could be done to um, do a few items before Zach gets here. We could, if you all have your lovely spreadsheets, um, take a look at our committee assignments. Uh, that would probably take us ten minutes at most, and, and then we could take a break and now. Uh, get started when Zach arrives. So that would mean shifting to item 4.5. Fetching spreadsheet. Okay. Uh, we will get going again in just a moment. Uh, just walked out. <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Malone went to fetch his um, his uh, paper version of this big spreadsheet.
Ken um, Mariah or whoever staff is as the staff is present uh, just to take notes and walk us through. Do you think that's necessary? That sounds fine. Verbalize yeah. I can, I can get those in the minutes and that sounds good. Okay. Um, then let's see. I think the I have on my stack um, Commissioner Wise's um, in committees on top. Uh, do you want to start, Nancy, and run through and uh, identify any errors? I think we've already made a couple of swaps. Um, I know that you had been interested in taking over the liaison role for the Port Ballas Chamber of Commerce, so that change has already been made. Um, and acknowledging the fact that uh, Commissioner Malone is serving as the uh, Commissioner Liaison for the Port Ballas Chamber Government Relations Committee. Um, and um, so those are both reflected and um, in the spreadsheets no longer on my um, list. Any other changes you'd like to note? No, um, I guess Commissioner Malone, ha have you been serving as the GAC liaison or Zan, were you doing that? We just split them? The Government, government Affairs Committee, I was doing both. Um, for the chamber, uh, and uh, that has been the way it was for six years. When they changed the chair role for the Government Affairs Committee at the chamber, um, the new chair uh, switched to Commissioner Malone. And um, so and I think that's because he's been working with the city's legislative committee, and he, so he automatically included Commissioner Malone. So I, I was no longer on the committee. So um, that's why it's split now. But I think that it's probably a good thing to have more than one person involved. So, um, uh, yeah. Commissioner Malone, are you happy with that role? Yeah, that, that group is not, as far as I know, has not been uh, very active lately. Uh, I remember a couple of meetings last summer. So, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, uh, New chair, I think, who yeah. had some enthusiasm and was trying to get um, get things going. Um, and it's been several months since I've heard, heard okay. anything. So. Uh, they used to meet monthly. Um, when I was in, in my first several years in office, it was a very regular meeting. Um, and it, it focused largely on uh, Corvallis issues. Uh, but it always presented me an opportunity as a commissioner to provide an update to the government um, affairs committee of the Corvallis chamber. And I found that to be a really good way to get um, county news out and in circulation. Um, so that was for me, the primary value of that government affairs committee and the same role at the, the chamber board, uh, providing the monthly updates to the chamber board about things going on at the county um, was very useful. And I always learned more about what was going on in the greater community and uh, in the city of Corvallis at those meetings. Those That was the primary value for me. Um, so um, yeah. I think that right now you are the one on their lists. So if you're willing to continue to uh, watch uh, the government affairs committee meetings, that's fine. Unless commissioner wise, you want to take that as well. Uh, well, I, if Pat is, wants to keep it, that's fine. If he doesn't, I would take it. So either way. Okay. Well, why don't we leave it as is and, and I will check in and see what the, government relations folks who uh, have in mind for this year. Okay. I, and I think I did hear that they were meeting, but I could be confusing that with something else. They probably just don't know to reach out to us would be my guess. Uh, there reach out to. Some significant disorganization since the staffing changes at the Corvallis Chamber. So I think it's very well worth reaching out and um, getting re-engaged uh, and that the changes have occurred not only at the staff level but at the board level at the same time um, and they uh, a lot of past practices shifted so yeah any other um, items to highlight on your list nancy nope i'm good okay 
Commissioner Malone, how about you? Bless you. Much excitement. It's so exciting. <laughs> um, uh, the, the only one I um, mind talking about is towards bottom Northwest Oregon Works. Uh, workforce Investment Board, um, basically quarterly meetings. Um, I don't need to go over the whole history, but uh, we are part of a group of, uh, with Lincoln, Tillamook, Clapsup, and Columbia counties. And uh, so we're the only Willamette Valley uh, county in this group. Uh, I have some concerns about the executive director uh, and her role, um, but um, I, I have a lot of history with it uh, and I'm not sure how much more energy I have to uh, put into trying to change or um, fix the our relationship there, but uh, uh, it, it's a federally mandated or federal money, state uh, governor's, uh, uh, I guess about 10 years ago, put us in this configuration that um, isn't isn't to our advantage. Uh, the, the only thing I, I think I'd have much um, interest in, in trying to uh, revive the idea of um, moving in with uh, uh, is that Lynn, Pope, Yamhill, Marion counties, or the, the Mid Willamette Valley group. And I had started on that about four years ago and uh, um, would require effort on the, on the governor's uh, staff and pandemic hit. And in fact, uh, we, we sent in a formal application to change. And uh, I'm sure that's somewhere. Uh, it might be in Governor Brown's um, administrative files. Archives, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I'm willing to continue, but just uh, let you know that uh, that one I wouldn't mind uh, at least getting help with. I think that um, I'm not gonna take on any new issue areas in my last year in office. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely not going to volunteer. Um, and it might be very timely to change when there's a new commissioner in office um, next year. Yeah, I can agree with that. I And my my schedule is full. I do not have room for anything else. Okay. Anything else? Uh, okay. I don't have any changes to mine. I, I went over this a couple of times with Mariah and made some small changes um, and tried to update some of the staff contacts. Um, but I think that we are pretty well set um, at this point. So I wanted to thank um, Mariah uh, because um, this process has gotten uh, faster and easier every year. It'll It'll be more complicated with the new commissioner coming on board next year. Um, but um, at this point, I think we are on a good track. So thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to take just a, a five minute break before we jump back into item 4.1 and welcome um, Zach. So um, reconvene at 9.55. Okay, welcome back everyone. And we are moving on to item 4.1, uh, 2024 legislative priorities discussion uh, led off by Rick Krager and Zach Reeves. Is Ryan with us online? 
Yeah, I don't think Brown's going to be joining okay. us. Okay. Uh, oh. So I'll, I'll <clears throat> Commissioner Roger, I will, Chair Roger, I'll tee this up. Um, again, delighted to have Zach here today from CFM. As you all know, they are our representative, uh, newly representative or re renewed, I should say. So congratulations. Uh, <clears throat> as they are, we are a contractor for uh, the upcoming. 2024 legislative session to help represent our interest going in uh, to that as well as of course as you all know with michael skipper and the federal uh, work that he is doing uh, you know that you'll be working with him on uh, going forward so what we wanted to do today was just uh, to provide a few things a couple of uh, first of all just an overview of the upcoming session and uh, jack's here to kind of share some of his insights give you idea of what the calendar looks like, uh, time frames, uh, rumors, anything, uh, all of the above. Uh, but we also want to talk a little bit about our priorities. Uh, I think as you all know, we have a, a couple of very important priorities uh, from a funding standpoint that we're looking to take forward. So we can also talk a, a little bit about that uh, and uh, also get some of Zach's uh, advice and thoughts about an approach uh, related to those particular items. So with that, I'm going to just to uh, turn it over to Zach to give you an overview, but I think as always, we will make this discussion as well. And so feel free to just jump on in with questions as we move through. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rick. Good to see you all. Um, happy to be here. Glad to be uh, re-up for, for another go at this. Um, so yeah, you know, we are, as you all are aware, headed into the 2024 legislative session, um, 35 days uh, mandated by the voters to, um, uh, theoretically, just balance the budget and get out of there. Um, we all know if you, if you give these folks um, the opportunity to uh, pass more bills, they're going to pass more bills. So uh, each legislator is limited to two bills per, per person. Um, committees have three bills. The presiding officer, Speaker Rayfield, uh, President Wagner, have kind of more latitude to introduce bills as they see fit. Um, so essentially, we're looking at a universe of about 250 to 300 bills likely in, in, in this session. Um, 35 days goes fast. I think the comparison is about every one day in the short session is equal to about a week um, in the long session. So um, the deadlines come quickly. I think the first chamber uh, work session deadline is the beginning of the second week. Um, so there's very limited time to pass um, any of these bills, and we are kind of um, coming off a, a period of, um, of walkouts by the minority party as a, as a tool of slowing the process down. Uh, there's a concerted effort by the leadership of, of the um, majority to uh, prevent a walkout. To, and so uh, there's a concerted effort to minimize the controversial um, bills that will be brought this session. I think the two issues, as, as you all are, are likely aware, the two issues that are going to occupy a lot of the air in the room, um, housing and homelessness, we've all seen the governor's um, $600 million package at, at this point that she put forward as what, what she wants to see the legislature do. Uh, and then some sort of, of um, reform to Measure 110 uh, is the other issue that is going to be occupying a lot of these folks' time. So on the housing and homelessness side, um, the governor has put forth a $600 million package that includes uh, $65 million for um, uh, shelter, shelter capacity improvements and operations, and then an additional $500 and change for um, infrastructure, uh, it, housing incentives, um, and, and other policies that will allow additional development of housing. So she's asking for a lot of that money to be come from, from the state's reserves. I think we're sitting on about $1.8 billion in reserves. Uh, the rainy day fund, she would argue that if this isn't a rainy day, um, then, then what is? Uh, I think that the some of the, the the money is stored in different pots, and some of those pots, the, the reserves require a three, three fifths vote. Some of them are a simple majority, so there's some calculus that needs to happen there in terms of where that money comes from specifically. Uh, I, if you had a crystal ball and um, 
I think we will see a lower dollar amount, but a pretty significant investment in um, housing, infrastructure, um, and and uh, shelter capacity for for some of these uh, local governments. So, um, you know that that's very much uh, still up for debate. There's some policy we all remember. I think House Bill 3414 from last session, um, in terms of it was the governor's uh, attempt to kind of clear some of the red tape and and allow for easier development of of um, housing areas that failed on the Senate floor on the last day of session. Um, the governor's office has done extensive outreach to mainly to cities because um, they're the ones that are most directly impacted by this uh, and has incorporated a lot of their feedback into um, a new proposal that's, that's pretty similar to what 3414 was, but has some concessions to cities to um, try to get that one across the finish line um, and kind of increase the the ability for developers to uh, develop, you know, to build more housing. So um, we've seen draft language on that from the governor's office. Uh, that is the LCs were due to be returned by LC by legislative council. Yesterday was the deadline for them to get them back to legislators. So we'll start to see a lot of legislative language here this week. Um, and uh, so it remains to be seen whether, you know, where LOC and cities specifically land on this new proposal, but that will be part of the uh, $600 million package that the governor has proposed. Um, on the Measure 110 side, as you all just discussed, um, LOC, AOC, sheriffs, chiefs of police have all um, arrived at the same position, which um, is is helpful for you all uh, as we as we move forward to this on the legislative side there's much less there's there's very little consensus as to what to do there um mo many of the republicans have advocated for a full repeal of measure 110 i think it's given uh, that they're in the minority it's incredibly unlikely that that's the end result um but somewhere in the middle between uh leaving it as is and full repeal is where we'll end up uh there's uh, a significant amount of disagreement internally in the legislature in terms of what to do. So that is kind of the wild card in session that we're likely to see. Um, there's an acknowledgement on all sides that something needs to get done um, and that that leaving it as is is not, you know, the status quo is not going to be acceptable politically or um, functionally uh, for the state. So. Um, there will be some sort of, of recriminalization likely. Uh, it's just a matter of how far uh, they decide to go. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, if you all have any questions, comments, Rick, if there's anything else you want me to cover, um, I'm happy to do so. Why don't we just pause, see if it, you know, kind of from a high level standpoint, any questions, thoughts about sort of what we're seeing going into the session? Probably a lot of the stuff maybe you've heard also mm -hmm. through AOC, but uh, just check on that. No, uh, I hadn't heard about uh, accessing the rainy day fund. Uh, what was the total? Six. So the governor's asking for six hundred million. Um, but what's what's in the in the fund? So it's the 65 million is for a lot of it is a lot of that 65 is going to be for. Um, operations funding for existing shelters that they pass in previous housing packages. So they, they gave one time infrastructure mm -hmm. funds to some of these local governments um, to build up uh, shelter beds. And then those mostly cities don't have any operational funding to operate them. So they are uh, essentially not going to be in operation if they don't get some of this operational funding moving forward to, to operate them. So that that's what a lot of that will be, not all of it. Um, there will be some, I believe, new capacity added or um, <coughs> operations funding for existing shelters. Um, and then, but the majority of it is gonna be for um, uh, infrastructure related projects. So, you know, your sewer, your water, your, your, um, your, uh, infrastructure projects that are going to allow for increases in buildable land um, and then some, you know, affordable housing incentives. Um, that's $500 million 
plus for that. And what's the total rainy day fund? 1.8 billion, I believe, is the total. And here locally, the emergency shelter dollars would be a great benefit to Unity Shelter to stabilize their operations year over year. And um, there has just not been a stable source of funds for uh, sheltering, and that would be a, a big difference. If they, if there are also funds that would allow for expansion, uh, that would be very helpful as well. Um, but um, very much in support of this. And then on the on the infrastructure side, the um, I know that system development charges don't do enough to extend sewer and water uh, out to new developments, and uh, developers are understandably very leery of getting involved when there is such expensive infrastructure that needs to be um, developed to expand beyond our current um, tight urban growth boundaries. And so we've kind of set up a little bit of a cliff, I feel like, in terms of development that way. Um, it, it's either got utilities or not. And um, it, the not is a, a big bill. So I'm, I'm glad to see that that discussion has become much more um, proactive. Um, curious to see how, how it lands. Yeah, you know, it will be, um, you know, there has been um, workers and, and, and conversations around what to do with SDCs and how those kind of factor into the mm -hmm. conversation as well. And I think um, this at, at least uh, puts a little bit of that on the back burner for now um, in terms of, of pulling money and, and incentivizing development from other sources rather than uh, uh, cutting, you know, some of these yeah. fees that are, that are, crucial to, to uh, you know, city and county operations. Yes. So um, that's good to see that, you know, they're looking at other methods rather than just cutting SDCs. Yeah, I, I, that would be, that would be bad. Commissioner <laughs> uh, Wise has a question. Commissioner Wise. Thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm going to have to jump off in just a minute, but um I agree, uh, Commissioner Ogero, what you were saying about funding, you know, emergency shelters. Is it, my understanding from what we just said is the money for that would come from the 600 million of the rainy day fund. And I guess my only concern there is if we can, if we're funding with, again, if this is one time, then we're sort of setting ourselves up for that cliff again in the future, if it's not a sustainable funding. Um, not that I would say no to any of our shelters getting more money. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll just say before I have to leave, you know, I look back at the last survey we did and the top four issues that our community members had were homelessness, affordable housing, crime slash drugs, and climate change in the environment. So that's where my focus is. Uh, commission wise, I think you, you know, that's a that's a good observation about the one-time funding. You know, it is um it's just, I think the reality of it is it's going to be an issue that that we as local governments are going to have to continually come back to the state for ongoing funding on this stuff. Um, you know, with the hopes of eventually making it such a routine that it's just incorporated into the state's budget building process. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's a uh, aspirational goal that I think a lot of these local governments have is just to make it such a routine that when the agency goes through the uh, agency recommended budget process, they start building in shelter operations mm -hmm. funding as part of their overall strategy. Yes. Yeah, just one comment also to that, and 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 I appreciate Commissioner Wise's point about the, the one time. I think, as you all know, the conversations we've been having with Rebecca and April and others is around how do we start to be a little more creative in the use of our dollars as it relates to, you know, the flexible spending uh, dollars and how do we partner with other um, organizations to try to demonstrate the outcome that we're achieving and the cost savings that are generated from that. And I'm very intrigued by the idea of a uh, affordable housing pool, excuse me, a homelessness pool of dollars that we can actually be able to revolve as opposed to always relying on that one time. And I know that's still a lot of work ahead, but one thing I would say as, and Zach, you probably know this, but to the extent that the dollars that are allocated provide us with that ability to be flexible and innovative with it and not have these strict parameters in terms of how you use it. I, 
I, I think we just have to think outside the box a little bit because Commissioner Wise points right on. I mean, we're going to be having to continue to go back to the trough to be able to get those resources and they may not always be there. So if we can design those very creative solutions, which I really applaud what Rebecca is doing uh, and thinking about uh, around that, I think that's the way to go. So flexibility, flexibility. <laughs> I think that that's a very good point. Um, and I know that from the standpoint of the legislature and the agencies and the governor's office, it's all accountability, accountability. <laughs> so right. there's always a tension. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, from the county perspective, we need as much flexibility as we can get. Sure. Yeah. I have one more question. Uh, in the continue, the $1.8 billion in the rainy day fund, is that also where the state uh, keeps pension costs as well, where we pay uh, our workers when they... When right. I mean, or is it go, are we rating that? Theoretically, that is baked into agency budgets. And, mm -hmm. and so, so that is a separate fund. Yeah. So it's protected. Um, <laughs> as of right now, yes. Okay. That's just important for our county employees. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't think, and, and um, I don't think there's anything stopping the legislature from theoretically spending that money on whatever they choose to spend it on. They have set it aside over several biennia. Um, there's no strings on other than the three fifths vote that I mentioned earlier. Um, that the th requirement for some of those funds, not all of them, you know, they're in, in different pots of money. Um, so the legislature has some discretion as to what to spend them on. And, and um, yeah, but there's been a strong bipartisan consensus to build up that rainy day fund. Yeah. And um, I see that um, Peggy Lynch from League of Women Voters is listening in and she's made a couple of comments as well and that we have, uh, our rainy day fund is um, is full mm -hmm. and, and over by 10%, she says right now. Yeah. So uh, there is some leeway there, mm -hmm. uh, but she's also very skeptical that legislators will agree to access it. Yeah. So um, there's, this is by no means a done deal. There will be some... Um, Wheeling and dealing uh, to get the housing money um, mm -hmm. that the governor is asking for. So to, to your point, though, Rachel, I think, uh, you know, as Jack said, state agencies are always dealing with those higher and higher employer, well, us as well, with higher employer rates for PERS. And so that liability, as it continues to grow, then there's more pressure on state budgets and there's more state pressures on state budgets. There's more pressure on, on the rainy day fund at some point. So it's sort of a... You know, kind of comes around uh, at that some point. Luckily, that I think that at least what we're seeing on the PERS side on some of the analysis is that uh, is smoothed a little bit. Still, of course, always rising, but it's smoothed a little bit. I think some of that is with some of the changes that they made in, in laws in terms of retirees, et cetera, in terms of buying down the liability. So that's had a little bit of a compounding impact on keeping rates at least down. But obviously, mm -hmm. it's something we're always going to have to deal with. Um, so to shift a little bit uh, in terms of the discussion to kind of get more specific to us and talk about our priorities as we as we go into this session, as I think you all know, we're, we're kind of looking at two major priorities uh, that are related to funding, uh, specifically uh, the first being, as, um, as we discussed earlier today with uh, your action on entering into a purchase and sale agreement for our children and family services facility. Uh, we have currently a $5 million request that has been put forward um, to the legislative fiscal office. And I know has also been uh, socialized with uh, Speaker Rayfield as well as uh, Senator uh, Gelster Bloom. So that is obviously something that's very, very important to us um, as, as dollars uh, from that would help us with the acquisition of our, our facility. Uh, also, um, again, if we're fortunate enough to do, to be able to get um, that full request, it also creates some flexibility for us around some of the work that we're looking at our Monroe Health Center. I think you all know, we, we'll find out more about where our federal appropriations sit, but uh, we still have a federal appropriation bill that uh, will bring us a million dollars for the replacement of the Monroe Health Center, but that does require a match. So we baked that request in because again, it all encompasses mental health support, behavioral services um, to be able to be flexible. So again, while our, um, you know, our, our first and foremost, our priority need is around the new facility. We want to be able to, to use those dollars to um, expand it elsewhere where we can. Um, 
So that I, I feel like we're in a pretty good place there. I'll look to Zach if he disagrees, but uh, again, we put forward, uh, it's in the queue. Um, and I know, I think Zach has probably been having various conversations as well. I'll let him share uh, what he knows or can share about that. And then the second, of course, being our, our courthouse project. Um, you know that uh, the state portion of that is uh, still currently short of what they need to be able to provide up to the 50% match. Uh, that is gonna be in the neighborhood of about a $6.9 million request. Uh, we did meet with the Oregon Judicial Department last week uh, just on some other projects, but I did bring this up. Uh, they are poised to move forward. I did uh, make sure that they knew that we were engaged and the commissioners are ready and able to help and support in any way they can. Uh, I think at least what I've heard is uh, from the legislative standpoint, I don't know if I can share, but uh, I think that there's interest in the OJD really being the lead uh, in this. I know that we've done a lot in the past to support that, uh, but I think that there's some pressures about them making sure they're stepping up and taking the lead on that um, and that we can come in and, and support. But from everything I've heard, at least to, to this point, um, both of those requests sound pretty pretty good. I don't think they're unreasonable. Uh, the second one, of course, is bond authority. Um, as a reminder, this will be bonds that will be issued in spring of next year. Uh, that would be so. So really, you don't have a financial impact to this because they always do that strategically, mm -hmm. so that there's no debt debt service payment due in the current volume. So that's a nice. Uh, obviously have costs down the road. Uh, so those are our, our two major you know, priorities as we move forward with our capital project. Zach, anything you can share, or I guess also any thoughts about advice strategy to us as we move forward with those? Uh, I, you know, I got first thing, you all are, you know, familiar with the dog and pony show of when we go up and testify in front of capital construction and for, you know, you get your two minutes. I think it's usually commissioner Ogero um, doing that. Um, so Plan on that again. Um, in regards to, I mainly really both of them. Um, there's a revenue forecast. I believe it's the beginning of the second week of February, and that's kind of um, going to give them a concrete target to hit in terms of how much um, additional funding they'll have, or you know, knock on wood, hopefully not. Uh, less, less funding. Seven. The seventh. Okay, that's what. I, so it is. It's. We start on the fifth, so it's it's the third day of session. Um, you know, we are in the middle of a biennium, so uh, these these odd or even numbered years are always um, a little uh, nebulous in terms of how much money there is. Um, we're not setting you know a biennial budget right now. We're just balancing the budget, tweaking some things. So there's less <clears throat> discretionary spending going on. Um, but as Rick said, you know, we are um, well positioned. For, for both these asks, um, you know, we, we talked earlier about uh, kind of getting to the point where uh, these sorts of things are baked into agency budgets. That's like where we're at with courthouse stuff, right? That was That is things that people just acknowledge that every biennium, this is something we do. We fund these courthouses. Um, the agency puts it in their budget. So that's, that's a little bit in terms of uh, what Rick was saying earlier in terms of OJD taking the lead on this. Um, getting their budget passed. So uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll knock on wood, uh, things will, will go smoothly and, and the revenue forecast will be um, trending in the positive direction. You know, I think uh, we keep waiting for the bottom to fall out ever since COVID hit and, and it has not really done so yet. Um, and so we'll see what they say, but um, it will be well positioned for them. Zach, one thing just to, to share with, with you, um, I know that we never get the choice in terms of uh, our color of money uh, when, when we do these type of requests, and certainly uh, we're open to any and all. I think um, obviously uh, the first project, our, our children's and family services uh, facility, um, could certainly be a bond funded uh, project. Uh, I would, of course, always advocate for a general fund appropriation similar to what we got with the crisis center, uh, because that has been um, 
so important for our crisis center project because it was it's flexible. Yeah. Um, so again, I know we don't get those, we don't get to pick, but uh, to the extent that we have any ability to hint at those opportunities, I think a general fund appropriation would be a much nicer fit for that one. Obviously the other one would be a bond mm -hmm. uh, project. Any question, commissioners, on either of those two priorities, concerns, or? Well, I, I guess just keep us posted uh, how we can uh, advance, especially the $5 million ask. That's, that's a, um, a big deal for us. And uh, 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 great story and, and um, we just talked about it before you came of authorizing the money and uh, that that uh, was kind of a two track system, the legislative ask and, and uh, our own uh, timetable. But uh, that's a exciting uh, addition and, and just that it's right in the neighborhood um, uh, is, is pretty amazing. Ties in well with you know uh, what both what Commissioner Wise was saying about the prior the, the community priorities and also what the legislature is prioritizing mm -hmm. these days as well. So. so I guess just one last thing to morph into, and I guess a good segue uh, in terms of I know in the twentieth we are set to have our legislative breakfast um, with and with invitations to uh, our members. One thing I just uh, note, and I, I talked to Zach early on, I don't know what opportunities exist, but to the children and family services, um, we talked, you know, I mean, the conditions that we currently provide services are, are not great. And I think the ability to be able to show uh, that, we've tried to do that with our talking paper, but sometimes it's best to see it with your own eyes. Uh, so if there is that opportunity, I know we talked early on uh, with uh, the members that would like to visit either definitely that the old facility, what we're actually trying to provide services in now, but also even the new facility, if that's if that's helpful, um, I think that would be a great opportunity. But I don't I know they're busy and uh, with their schedules, but maybe that's something we could could still possibly pull together uh, to help uh, draw that support. And then, of course, I believe we're all set up for the 20th. Uh, I think we're, we're moving towards that. Uh, looking at more and more, mostly, uh, in terms of uh, Saturday, Saturday. And then I think that there were still some questions about maybe a secondary um, after this, kind of like a post-session wrap-up. And I know initially when we had talked to Zach, the, I'm sorry, Mar Laura, uh, March 16th was the date that we had kind of circled was uh, Saturday the, the 16th. I think I inadvertently told her uh, the 15th. But um, if that, I think the only reason that we thought that might not work is because we didn't know if the session would actually be done then because it does, I think, go, I think the calendar calls it to go up to the potentially that week before the 16th, which was one of the reasons that we have suggested that. But, you know, they could always end early. March 10th. Is March 10th. Thank you. March 10th is, is so that that was kind of the strategy when Rachel and I had talked to Zach was thinking that, okay, what if it does go all the way up to the 10th? They obviously do not know the results. And that March date was already confirmed with the League of Women Voters, correct? Because they have um, an um, end of session update as well. That was my understanding. Coming earlier in March. Well, earlier in March. Um, yeah. One of the issues that I was going to ask the board for direction on relative to the March breakfast was that the legislative session never breakfast was that um, the board and other county staff are scheduled to attend um, celebrate Corvallis and that, and, and, as well as the community on March, which is Friday, March 15th. So um, I was going to ask the board for some direction on whether we want to have the breakfast on March 16th. I, 
I, I know we've traditionally, you know, done, tried to line these up with what the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. have done because those are events that generally our delegation likes to attend as well. So I don't know. I don't know what sounds like they are maybe on the the ninth. There they have one or they actually have something good. Second. Yeah. Second. The, okay. the, the league traditionally did the uh, uh, first Saturday of, of okay. the month. Okay. And uh, while well, Peggy Lynch is online, she's she works primarily with the state uh, league of women voters rather than Corvallis. Um, but Peggy, if you do have uh, information about that, that would be helpful. Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it's just a question of whether we want to uh, stay with the same date. And I think we're more likely to get um, uh, Senator Gelser Blue and, and Representative Rayfield, Speaker Rayfield, if we stick to the same date. Um, it's just a higher probability. But we can also reach out and ask them if they would be willing to come for an after session wrap up. Um, but, uh, but I would definitely re reach out and ask now, not wait until then. I'm going to see the speaker on Thursday, and I can also stop by Senator Gelsen's office um, either tomorrow or Thursday and get some details of that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. And we do have a, we did get a confirmation that Senator Gelser Bluen's available on the 20th, but uh, Speaker Rayfield, I'm not certain yet. Okay. Um, all I got, I'll ask, I'll ask that day. would be great. Um, I just heard back from a staff person that it, um, it's on the calendar for review. Chair Sean McGuire would like to ask a question. Yes, Sean. Um, pardon? I, I think so. You might want to come up to the table because otherwise the people online won't be able to hear you. I'll get this chance because so I just want to take advantage of it. <laughs> We're talking not so much about budgets, and I was curious on there was a story right before the holiday about the kicker. And I was curious that there's a lot of talk about that. And is that going to be part of the short session day because because this has a lot to do with the rainy fund and I and for you I was with the governor's budget up for a short stint. That's what everyone knows. I, I mean that's that's another thing that takes a that it takes a, a a vote. You know I think it's in the constitution, so I believe it's yes. either a three fifths or two thirds vote. I think it's, um, I think it's two thirds. It might be. I think I think two thirds is right. Yeah, I think. Um, and and there the reality is there's just not. Two thirds, you know, there's they don't have the the what would be twenty and twenty and forty and twenty on in each chamber to do it. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen the number; it's at north of five billion now. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's a lot of folks who maybe believe we could spend the money. Uh, you know, it could be better spent, but um, you know, I think uh, in in coming biennia there might be conversations around. You know, property tax reform, tax reform generally mm -hmm. in the state. Um, that's a that's a uh, hefty conversation <laughs> that's not going to be accomplished. You know, in a short session. Absolutely, I, yeah. see, I haven't seen that much momentum. Yeah, so much press and also nationwide, they're all out of the states or from thirteen or others. I would just give them the long term. Sure. Thank you for that. Senator, yeah, Senator Morris worked on that for a decade, uh, trying to. Get rid of the uh, kicker, uh, revise the kicker, uh, and to, instead of the 2%, uh, the revenue forecast has to be within 2%. I think he, uh, 6% um, move pieces around, uh, reduced uh, income tax, uh, to, to, to revenue neutral. And uh, I think he got, uh, he was a Republican. He got better support from the Democrats than he did from Republicans. And this was in the aughts. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, he worked at it, had credibility as a, a business person and, and a moderate Republican. And I'm not sure he advanced the conversation at all. There were conversations, but as far as uh, getting to anything actionable, uh, I think he, he left. It's, it's a heavy lift. And I think uh, the poor state economists are in a no win situation because if they put that number too high and it doesn't meet it, then all of a sudden you've got a budget gap that you've got to fill. And if they put that number too low and they exceed it, then 
a lot of that money is going back to um, the taxpayers. So it's a, it's a thankless job. Any modeler that gets within 2% uh, right. accuracy right. is doing a really, really good job. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I didn't mean to hide your conversation, but it's fine. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. I do think that the property tax conversation is going to come up. It's uh, definitely in the wind. Uh, it's been a discussion at the Association of Oregon Counties regularly. Um, um, Peggy's also saying that she's, it's likely to come up in the next session. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's not ripe for a short session, that's yeah. for sure. Well, tagging on that, um, uh, reforming measure 110, uh, has there been enough discussion? Is there uh, anything uh, close to a package? Because there's not really a lot of time to uh, uh, kind of redefine and, and uh, tweak and in, in in this short session. Uh, you're absolutely right. There, it's it's. I mean, they are up against the wall on this one, and uh, there is an acknowledgement from all sides and all interested parties that something needs to be done. Um, there's still some pretty significant disagreement, um, even internally amongst each caucus as to what exactly needs to be done. So um, that's kind of, for me, is is the kind of the wild card for the whole session. Um, they have to do something. Uh, what they do is still a long ways from being determined. So. I know there's a lot of conversation going on on a very regular basis among the different um, parties. Uh, and so I, I, there's a strong interest in getting to some sort of um, compromise and an omnibus package. Yeah. And I think that there's agreement on certain areas. It's really the decriminaliz recriminalization that is the biggest issue. Um, so um, part of what we were discussing yesterday was that uh, as uh, an association, we didn't want to weigh in on what level of recriminalization or anything else that, that needed to be left to the legislature and, and um, district attorneys association. But um, yeah, I think that that's, that's going to be the sticking point. And uh, we just need to see what the, how the politics fall. No, I, you know, the idea, uh, ideally, they get to, you know, 60 votes in the House and 30 in the Senate, and, but um, all they really need is 31, 16, and 1 uh, to pass something. So uh, it's, it's complicated, and, you know, folks have been working hard for a long time on getting mm -hmm. something that works for enough people. Would it be possible instead of, well, we're like you were saying, these 11 items or whatever need fixing, in, uh, would it be possible to do the low hanging fruit and say there's good agreement on these five, let's advance that, this in the short session and keep working on the more difficult issues or is this a package that? Uh, I think that would be the worst case scenario mm -hmm. for the outcome for them in terms of, of how this works, but. Because that would take the pressure off of uh, doing a comprehensive. It would just kick the can down the road, mm -hmm. essentially. So they would still, you know, they would, they still have to get to a final conclusion, whether that is um, by the end of, you know, the 35 days or whether um, they have to come back in some sort of special oh, session okay. for that is, you know, that's, that's, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here, um, but. Uh, you know, it, it is, they, they, there is consensus. The, the one thing they all agree on is that something has to be done. Um, so <clears throat> more to come on that. Okay, so I, th I think that's it, Chair Israel. Obviously, if there's other issues or areas of concern that you want to make sure Zach and team are, are looking at, uh, certainly now, or if something comes up, obviously, I think you all have Zach's contact information and it's available to us anytime. And um, certainly encourage you to reach out to him if there's something that comes up that you have some, some interest in or want to 
explore as we move through that. I believe Zach also, uh, he mentioned, I think about 250, 300 bills. They'll be looking obviously at anything that has direct impact and he will forward those to me and I will disperse out, uh, probably Lindsay will disperse out to folks that uh, of interest if he sees anything that is, is really, a lot of times the broader type bill policy bills that are maybe covered by AOC. We don't necessarily have to do analysis on but if there is something specific uh, that he sees before in those and Lindsay and I will work to make sure they get to the appropriate department heads and first picture. Just one question, and that is, um, there is a bill that uh, Sarah Gelser is introducing, um, LC-130. And um, have you heard anything about the prospects for that? No, I, what, what uh, is this, uh, what, what is it? it? It requires the Oregon Health Authority to provide services to folks under 21 years of age who are charged with violating the law. Uh, it, it's, it involves folks with a developmental disability and um, uh, that become justice involved that also have mental health issues. Uh, and I have not read through the entire text, um, but I think it's the same uh, legislation basically that she introduced last year, but she's socialized it a lot more sure. as a broader. Sure. Religion. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure, you know, where that stands mm -hmm. is obviously something that she cares deeply about. Right. It'll be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think uh, TBD on that, but we are starting to see some of the LCs kind of trickle out here and there. Um, none of them are, they're not public <laughs> yet, but um, they're being shared around and mm -hmm. uh, they'll be put into bill form. I think the deadline to drop bills is this Friday, um, and then we'll see the bill stack sometime end of the month here. Um, okay. That's when you all will get bombarded with bills. So, okay. so. <laughs> like Can't wait. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, back to uh, uh, seeing if we can get uh, some of our elected to tour the uh, new building. Uh, we've got a uh, on January 24th, and I think we start here. Um, it's going to be a, a ribbon cutting for the Oak Creek evacuation route. But, uh, and I'm uh, Senator uh, uh, Gilser Bluen is uh, scheduled to be uh, me on that tour. And it seems like I saw the uh, sheet for it. Uh, and I think we start here. Mm -hmm. so, start here. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're in the neighborhood. I, I don't know if that complicates things, but if it didn't work out on the uh, 20th to um, give her or uh, Rayfield a quick tour. Of the, what time does that start? Nine or nine, 10 in the morning. Nine, nine I probably after would be a better. It starts at 10, I guess we do earlier, but. I think it's at 10. It, it's, I think. You said the 24th, was that right? Yeah. Okay. 10. Okay, 10. Well, that, that's that's at Oak Creek. That is so, the entire uh, event that oh, um, okay. the, the convene here at 10. There's some speaking depart um, at 1030 and arrive back here at 1105. So. Okay. Um, either, either side of it. Really. Yeah. Okay. And of course, things always run a little long. So I would say before 10 or after 1130. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can connect. Yeah. I mean, no yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank you Zach. All. And, and don't forget, Zach, we, we like good news. Okay, uh, moving on, our next item on the agenda is a review of the leadership policies manual. And I believe that we have, um, uh, yeah, Commissioner Weiss is no longer with us at the moment uh, because she is taking care of her daughter. Um, but uh, Rachel, the floor is yours. Sure, so this particular policy um, seemed to come 
around by my predecessor, Joe Kirby, in March of 2021. Um, in, in short order, for simple language, it's kind of like the rules of the road. What is a county administrator's responsibilities and what are the responsibilities of our board of commissioners? So it's a governing statement. And it really gives some opportunities around and surrounding powers and duties and responsibilities of county government. I think all of us are always talking to folks in the community of what is a county administrator and, and what is a, a, a member of the board of commissioners. I believe we work fairly hand in glove in general, um, working together to make our county government work. So really uh, around this document, it kind of breaks down the commitments of the board um, the board staff, as well as um, the different roles that both of us uh, play. Um, as some folks know, and some who may not know, the county administrator and the county attorney do advise the board on a day-to-day -day operational task. However, the county administrator really is the COO of um, Benton County and all its operations, uh, lots of fiduciary responsibilities, um, really looking at our staff and operational needs. Of course, the board uh, does work hand in glove on major um, strategic directions, including high level directors that are put into our directors, as well as anything that is proposed, whether it's a reorganization and whatnot. Some do know and some don't know, the county administrator presently has 17 direct reports and then also works weekly, daily with each county commissioner. But in general, this kind of trying to help uh, folks uh, as well as employees, constituents, people in the community, what roles and responsibilities fall under each and our commitment to you. It's also a really great opportunity to look at our job descriptions mm -hmm. and what we do and what we don't. Um, therefore, um, the best way to look at it would be an example. An example would be, and you can correct me if you want, but for folks to understand that a, a commissioner does not supervise um, any uh, department heads or employees in Benton County. That does not mean that they do not talk to me on uh, a daily or a weekly basis if they find some services are not uh, meeting the standards of what the community needs. And we are going to continue to have those conversations. It also means it, a lot of this is about communication and it's about um, working with um, our departments. And we have no issue with um, our commissioners speaking with um, our directors, um, but it is requested that um, the county administrator is consulted on a regular basis, especially when it has to do with an operational change, uh, a personnel change, um, or really just an idea that's a policy that should really go in a more of a public area or on our one-on-ones. And again, for folks on this, we do meet uh, on a weekly basis with all three commissioners and they are all very, very perceptive, smart, committed public servants who are even closer to the community than, um, than I am and even our directors because they not only have a job here during the day, uh, but they are also uh, constantly out in the community in evenings and weekends. And that feedback is crucial to, to me, as well as our directors to be able to be part of that. Therefore, that is why commissioners are involved in our leadership meeting. Um, leadership meetings are really an important opportunity for folks to see what our directors are up to. And um, there are some confident discussions that work on it. That being said, in leadership, we are also having discussions of times when the commissioners may be part of the first half of the leadership meeting, and then we may have more confidential conversations uh, dealing with issues that, um, in general, may be more internal, internal processes and um, that work. So again, this is kind of like a rules of the road. I know all three commissioners are very um, committed to it. Um, so I really want to open it up to discussion or changes. I have not edited this document. I've gone through it since day three that I've gotten here. And I think it's a very well-written and well and thoughtful um, document that, of course, anybody can read online as well. Um, and I open this up, really, I'm throwing this on the chair and our commissioner of any issue or direction with this document that you would like to edit, change, or discuss further. Uh, I would say from my perspective, um, I really value this document. Um, 
the Benton County leadership policies and practices because it does outline the lanes, um, at, at, so to speak, uh, where, where we operate as commissioners versus um, our staff. And we do have two direct reports, the county administrator and the county attorney, the county council. Um, but those are the only two. Um, and all other operational decisions and staffing decisions are made by the county administrator and her direct reports at the, at the department leadership level. Um, and that policies and practices also outlines the relationship between the county administrator, county council, and the other two electeds, uh, the sheriff and the district attorney, uh, who both have um, a unique relationship among department heads um, because they are directly elected by the community. Um, so uh, it, it's been a very helpful document for all of us. It, it has uh, at times made it uh, much easier to address issues where one of us gets out of um, sync with the others um, and gets too involved in operational details. Um, or uh, it, it's also eased in the past county administrator relations with, with the sheriff and the district attorney because they have a, a clear uh, mutual understanding of um, relative responsibilities and rules of the road. So I don't have any changes at this point in time. I just wanted to make sure that we brought it up um, and that we acknowledged it once again, and that we want to reaffirm that we want to continue to use these rules of the road moving forward. So any comments? Uh, uh, I remember a number of um, discussions with uh, Joe Kirby and, and well, we're going to go through the manual and uh, it was uh, ambitious and it seemed like uh, unless we um, do dis discrete pieces, we never got very far. And, and uh, what we're talking about today makes sense. That's what we're directly involved with, and it's good to um, remind us uh, where our lanes are and aren't. And um, so I, I'm um, fine with it. And I, I think it probably needs to come back uh, on a regular basis, even if it's five or 10 minutes worth of, well, anything we need to adjust or um, but uh, uh, I, I know a lot of work has, has gone into getting us to this point. And now it's, I guess, our job to honor what's uh, written down. In all due respect, you know, you've had an incredible 2023 with, uh, you know, losing a longtime county administrator and then uh, two individuals who stepped up as acting. So, um, it's important to note that the commissioners also stepped up during that time to help uh, and guide uh, politics to stay things on. And of course, also delayed some decision-making until I got here, which I really appreciate. So one of the things I will actually instruct Maura to is we should also send this out to all our directors as well, because um, it's a good reminder. We've had some new directors join us this year. Um, there's not a, a robust onboard for our directors sometimes. Uh, so it's not. It's also a good reminder for them as well and our two electeds, the sheriff and the DA, um, because it is uh, outlined this as well. So I look forward to working and uh, we all have an ambitious 2024 that we're gonna work on. And, um, and I think I give an update later on and we'll be talking more and more about sh our shared vision for the county. I guess just to um, follow up on what I was saying, uh, it, it would help me anyway if uh, on a regular basis, uh, uh, refer to the policy that we're dealing with um, that day. Sure. Just the, uh, so it's not such a, book on the shelf kind of uh, document. It, it's something that living and um, needs to be uh, more towards the center of our attention than sometimes it has been. And like you say, last year was, was challenging and now um, trying to get all the pieces in place and um, Hopefully, um, be a little more routine, and this document uh, 
helps you know, guide our routine uh, operations. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, that was a short discussion, but I think a valuable one just to, again, to reaffirm our commitment to the uh, leadership um, policies and practices as they're laid out in this document. Okay. And, and maybe at a future leadership meeting have a agenda item of uh, referring to this manual and uh, uh, that we were uh, trying to keep it fresh and, and uh, useful. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for Rick and he is not present. So oh. <laughs> um, I think he's, I think, I think Sean just fetched him, right? Rick Krager? Yeah. I was in there Thank you. Time. Thank you for doing that. Um, let's see. We are going to be done well before one. That's great. But we do have an executive session. I can also go to my commissioner administrator updates if you want. Um, yeah, let's hold off just a minute. The other item we have is the calendar review. Oh, sorry. That's all. We should talk about that. Later. Yes. Okay. We are ready for item 4.3, uh, discussion regarding the establishment of a fund to construct a new Benton County Jail. Thanks, Chair uh, So this is, I, I don't have any handouts or anything like that. I wanted this to be more discussional with, with you all in terms of thoughts, um, or approaches around looking forward with you know, a new jail. Yeah, and I know that that's something we've, we've had various conversations in different avenues about what are our next steps are going to be. So when it, you know, when it comes down to it, I mean, let's just say it, I mean, we're, 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 we're talking probably a, a 60 million plus type project. And typically when I hear those kind of numbers, my head always goes to financing and that uh, to do that kind of thing, you don't usually save enough dollars in, in a government budget to actually buy it all outright. You're usually looking at how do I um, create the kind of cash flow and fund balance um, so that we can sustain a debt service payment. That's that's really where my focus goes. And, and so when sustaining a, a debt service payment, I mean, first and foremost, we, we want to try to figure out, one, how much debt can we, debt service can we afford on an annual basis and yet still maintain our general fund, and I call it the discretionary fund balance, at a, a level that is, I always like to say, best practices. So you all, and I will draw this up for you again, but I know Commissioner Miller, and you remember the, the, the bar, the line charts I've done for you in the past is saying, you know, our best practices is typically a fund balance, a general fund balance that is approximately 30% of of what our general fund revenues or general fund expenses are that's sort of the best practice standard you can go above it you can go below it uh, but you recall before we did our issuance with the courthouse we were plus 70 percent we were in a very very nice financial position and we still are in a very nice financial position because we issued you know, 36 million dollars and that brought us approximately to about 36 percent um, give or take. Um, of course, it always changes every time you get an annual financial audit and report. But um, so, and at the time we talked about what are some of the key things that are going to happen over the next several years that are going to put us back to a place where we can potentially borrow again. And um, as I've looked at the horizon of fund balance, it has constantly grown for us over the years. Um, we also have a time coming up here in about three years where we are going to be uh, paying off debt. Uh, we have our PERS bonds that are going to actually come to maturity and we're, we're not going to have that debt service. So that is going to free us up 
to really be able to go out and potentially do more. Um, and again, it's always going to come down to, okay, how much do we want to push the envelope? And um, my job is to try to make it to where we can do the things we want to do, but yet still always, always be in that, that place. So, so first and foremost, I would say to you from a new jail standpoint, I think if we, if we are to look to, to do this within our own um, financial capacity, that is usually the best way to do it. Um, now, of course, there's always the possibility, do we get a, a levy passed at some point or increase passed at some point that would provide us more general fund to be able to put towards uh, a, the, 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 the debt service? And that's always a wild card as well. Um, we could, as part of this discussion, we could set up a fund. It's, it's easy to set up a government fund and begin saving money um, uh, or, or putting money away. Um, I go two different directions on that. I mean, part of it is, is that you basically would just be taking from one fund and putting it in another because usually the fund balance of the general fund is what we look to, to keep growing so that we have capacity. That's essentially our savings account, our rainy day fund. Um, and that runs, you know, right now, uh, our estimates show, you know, somewhere between 26 and $28 million is about where, where we have run. And that has been pretty stable and continuously, continuously growing. Um, but if, if we do that, it's, so the dollars go into a fund, it sits there um, and it can grow, uh, but ultimately it's all gonna be looked at if we are ultimately gonna try to finance this ourselves. Um, the other thing I guess I, I put out there about pulling money to save into a fund is um, we're gonna also be spending some money. Um, and there's going to be some issues coming uh, in front of all of you here in the next six months where we have all talked about salaries and some of the impacts to market studies uh, that have been done. Uh, obviously, we are going to be moving into a, a bargaining session. Um, it's not difficult to look and see what we're seeing across the state, across the nation on, in terms of what increases are looking at. They are big. I think you know, recently we talked about EM Hill County, 13%. I mean, these, these are significant increases. I don't know, you know obviously where, where things end up landing, but the, you know, the economy has not, you know, we've been in a situation with historically high inflation. And now is the time where you're starting to see a lot of those things. It's time to catch up uh, in relation to salaries and, 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 and getting the balance. So, it's like I can, it, 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 it kind of sort of compounds. You take money away to save, you take money away to be able to expend for some of these other things. So I'm open, I mean, there, there's so many different ways for us to, to, to approach this. And, and, and I, I certainly think, you know, if, if it is the uh, desire of the commissioners to want to try to have some kind of just uh, dollars that we could set aside and demonstrate that we're dedicating that. Um, I, of course, would look at that as, okay, that's, there's this pot and there's this pot. And ultimately, I just put it together to be able to say, what can we do in relation to that? It also, it's good if we are putting money away. It's a signal that these are dollars that we can maybe match against a potential other, uh, you know, bond uh, proposal down the road, whenever that time may be. Um, so, um, like I said, you know, my, as a finance guy, my head always goes to I'm I'm managing aggressively the fund balance uh, of the general fund on how do I keep making that thing grow, um, and some of the strategies I take on when when managing the budget is how do I look at all of the different restricted revenues and maximize the use of restricted so that unrestricted isn't taken away because that's the flexible dollar. So for example, I look over here at my colleague, April Holland, who has, you know, variety of different types of grants and things that we use in the health department. Are we maximizing, always maximizing the use of that and not putting the pressure on the general fund? Can we reach out for other grants and be able to use that to pay for, you know, supports that and now enables us to grow. What about fees? I know we talk about fees a lot. Are we uh, charging as much as we should? We have a lot of programs to where we have fees, but whatever those fees don't pay, the general fund has to pick up. So 
those are always you know tough decisions that you do do you do increase fees but what that does is that shrinks the pressure on that unrestricted general fund balance and grows it to where we can all get those number ratios up more and put us in a position where maybe we could go out and issue um, a certain amount of bonds when it comes to actually bonding, I'm just using the example of the courthouse, we issued $36 million. That took us from about 70 to 36, like that. So think about that from the standpoint, if we are looking to borrow dollars, how much of an impact it would have. I mean, we'd have to get back up to that 70% to probably borrow another, let's say 36 to $40 million. So, so it takes time. It, it, it will take time to be able to get to the place if we're actually going to finance that. But again, if we are able to demonstrate what we can do on our side uh, in terms of the full faith and credit of the county, perhaps then that's an incentive to say, I don't know, 50-50 match. We're able to put in 50% and then the other 50% comes from potential bond measure down mm -hmm. the road. So, so many different ways that we can go about doing this in the long term. Um, I guess the only other thing I throw out, and I've, I've never been a big fan of these, but I'm not saying that it's impossible. Uh, we can always put out 40-year bonds. We, we traditionally put out 20, 25, and 30. I usually don't model those because I'm kind of a conservative guy, but at the same time, uh, you know, our underwriters have said you can consider 40-year bonds. It's longer, a lot more, it's more expensive down in the long run. But when you know you have a lot of facility projects, we can always look at a 40-year structure. Um, rates aren't terrific right now. Uh, you know, when we issued the bonds back in June, uh, we 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 caught a great break. So you know, we've nearly almost doubled since that time. So hopefully, rates will go back down. So it's not a, you know we get back to a place of comfort. So I know I'm throwing a whole bunch of different types of things. I guess I just wanted to make this more discussional about you know, what your interests are because based on you know where you want to try to get, I can start to I can create any kind of different type of structure that starts to meet your objectives. Yeah, I, I'm really sorry that uh, Commissioner Wise isn't here for this discussion as well. Um, so uh, this is the first discussion, um, and we will definitely circle back to it. Um, I think from my perspective, what I would like to convey is um, my, my commitment to uh, both uh, our organization and to community that to prioritize uh, the need for a new um, jail or correctional facility, um, it, the one we have is inadequate. And it, it, there's so many different reasons <laughs> we've spoken to again and again. Um, we, I don't wanna face a crisis where we uh, all of a sudden have to build um, under threat of litigation or um, federal, um, concerns about the status of our jail. Uh, so I would like to consider setting aside some funds and a dedicated fund to indicate that we are actively building that capacity to either bond um, on full faith and credit or to match a future bond measure, um, but that it is a priority. I think that one of the things that's difficult for community members is that we, we, we do continue to do other things as we're waiting to, again, amass the capital to, to build a new jail. Uh, so a new campground, uh, the building for children's and family behavioral health, all of which are also, uh, you know, especially in the case of the children and family uh, behavioral health building is a, a critical need right now. Um, and it's an upstream preventative measure to try to keep of children and families stable so that in the long term they don't end up justice involved and in the jail population. Uh, so that is something that is a clear priority and, and I think the community understands that, but we also need to balance that out by saying, yes, we have this other need and we're, we're starting to focus on it now. We're not gonna wait until we have another bond measure on the ballot. Yeah, so good commissioner, we absolutely hear, hear what you're saying, and that, that's really helpful. And certainly, um, like I said, I wanted to kind of get a 
feel for where you wanted to go before I gave you a proposal mm -hmm. on how that would work. I have some ideas on how we could um, sort of capture what you're talking about, sort of that, and like I said, that, that designated, I'm not going to say fun, I'm going to say designated account mm -hmm. in relation to how we put uh, those dollars aside, but at the same time still sort of keep that big picture in yes. mind of how do we show our general fund balance continue to do this so that at some point, you know, interest in the positive about interest rates right now is we're getting really good returns. And so that's helping to grow some of our balance as well. So I want to continue to work towards a financing strategy yes. as well. So I think that there's some ways that I could accomplish both mm -hmm. uh, and, and then be able to also uh, give to you uh, and, and show and demonstrate here's the dollars that we're putting away on a, uh, you know, either an annual basis or uh, some form of basis in which uh, we are growing this dollar that becomes sort of dedicated yes. towards our issue. The other thing, I guess, just to think outside the box a little bit too, and, and I always, you know, think how do I how do I bolster more of our uh, our, our our fund balance? How do we how do we grow that more? You know, it always comes down to expenses. I mean, what are what are the things we're doing right now? I mean, we've had conversations, obviously, about fleet, and we will continue to have conversations about fleet. But those are things that obviously they take away from mm -hmm. that uh, ability. While we're trying to grow this up, that's also bringing us down yeah. as well. So I think how do we discipline ourselves to some of those areas where they're important? but this is a bigger priority and how can we avoid <clears throat> taking from that fund balance and to be able to put there are are there certain services that we're looking at i mean obviously our jail is getting to a situation where it's it's very difficult to manage it i've uh, had conversations with the sheriff's office and others i mean is there temporary curbing of of expenses and, and ways in which we can help to grow that so that we can buy the jail i know those are really those have a lot of impacts across the board in terms of cutting costs in other areas to save but i just think we should be open to to that um i think what we do we're very prudent right now and we've seen nice balance but how do we how do we go faster? Mm -hmm. um, and there's different strategies that we can take on the expenditure side too. Well, I think that um, we want to look at all the options. Um, and I can certainly understand not wanting, uh, setting aside a dedicated fund also means that there's a little bit of a limitation of flexibility for doing other things. Um, but this is a priority. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. I think this is in looking at Rachel, this is a good um, you know leadership discussion as well because we all play a role in this. I mean, most every one of your departments has a general fund expectation. So how can everybody come together and say, all right, this is where we really need to put our 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 efforts as a priority. And so what can we do in every one of our departments that might be more efficient or maybe uh, reduce some cost here and there so that we grow that general fund balance. This can really be more of a leadership effort as well, because like I said, there's not outside of the health centers, it's about the only one that has, you know, everyone else has a pretty much reliance on the general fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, I think uh, I raised this question with you a couple months ago, just, um, Absolutely nothing specific, but we've done a, a pretty good job, a really good job of well, like the EOC, okay, uh, uh, relatively uh, small dollar amount, and, and we were successful at getting uh, state and federal dollars to uh, cover what eighty percent of the cost. Uh, so the correctional facility is the elephant in the room that, that's that's left from our uh, bond measure la last May, and, and um, my thought was just uh, uh, trying to not have such a steep hill to climb to get to the dollar amount that, that we need. Uh, I'm. <clears throat> Pretty well convinced that we've got the design for the facility that we need. 
um, here's the cost. And uh, uh, there was discussion of, well, uh, reduce it 20%. Okay, and I think the estimate was, well, you'd say 10%. You would now have a facility that's not um, nearly as good as what you have designed, and you've uh, saved 50 cents on the dollar, uh, which uh, I don't think is a, a good uh, trade off. But what I like, and um, I think uh, Zan mentioned the word flexible, and I'm, I'm a big fan of. Uh, flexible money, but also <clears throat> that, that we've made a commitment. Uh, we are making a commitment. We need, uh, and I think a lot of the comments uh, after last May, during last May's vote, oh, we need a, a jail correctional facility, but, and, and there were enough uh, things to, for our community not to like about the bond measure that they voted against it, but not, I don't think that was a, really changing the notion of, yeah, we, we, uh, we need a new facility. So anything, uh, I, I think it's important for us to be on record that this is a priority and uh, I will leave to you to work your magic on, on, on the specifics. But, but I think we need to uh, let the community know that we're working on this and, and it's a big lift, and, uh, but uh, we, will, we will get there. Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can put together sort of a, a proposal to you, knowing kind of where you want to land and uh, wanted you to understand sort of the things that, that I'm looking at as well. And I can, you know, one, it's it's easy to kind of set up sort of a, a redirection of dollars and be able to demonstrate a, a effort and dedicated effort towards uh, growing dollars, but also just, you know, some other strategies that can make, help us get there faster. You know, Rachel and I talked a lot about um, facilities right now and obviously we make some some good good decisions i think going forward in terms of providing adequate uh, facilities but i also think we have opportunity to maybe maximize the use of our facilities and potentially uh, leverage dollars through mm -hmm. perhaps selling of existing property and, and looking at ways to do it and those are monies that could then be dedicated you know towards towards the savings account if you will so um so i think it's a combination of you know, setting up the counter of the fund, that's easy. Uh, redirecting or having some redirection strategy, that's easy. It's really how do we grow it quicker um, and how do we uh, yet still be able to maintain a healthy fund balance growth so that we could potentially finance as well. Yeah. Um, because I always believe that's, you know, if, the, if the market's right, that's that's the place that you can you know, get it done, uh, especially with a, a very sound balance sheet right now. Well, and, and we have the site. And yeah, we're, exactly. We're the developing, there. so we're we're not starting at zero. Uh, so, if I could have maybe uh, it's a month, okay, uh, yes. to 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 be able to um, maybe come back to you with sort of here's here's a here's a way uh, to give you an idea what it might look like. Um, like I said, give give some thoughts around maybe some other initiatives that we could take on to. To further that, if if that's appropriate, that sounds great. Okay. Uh, I mean, my uh, idea is just that uh, we are focused on this, and and, uh, and instead of just words, the um, here here's how we're uh, planning on getting to our goal. Uh, you mentioned the twenty twenty seven PERS bonds maturing. Yeah. Uh, what what kind of dollar amounts that? What what kind of dollar? Oh, uh, oh, uh, we're going to test me now, aren't you? Uh, uh, we were about a million a year is what we're paying on debt service. Okay. Don't quote me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah. It's rough, rough, roughly about a million is what what we are what we've saved then in terms of not having to dedicate dedicate towards debt service. 
Now, having said all this, there's always the unknown, right? We yeah. don't know what purge rates are going to do. Purge rates could take off. You know, we we're hoping a leveling and we may have to look at site accounts mm -hmm. and things that are going to keep our employer rates from blowing it outside. So those are always things. I already mentioned salaries and wages. We're going to have to deal with those things as well. So, so while we're trying over here, there's also going to be some other pressures that we have to balance as well. Um, yeah, and and again, I I think that there are you know the question also where are there other funding opportunities like you said with emergency operations center, are there places that we can find dedicated dollars elsewhere that could could help support this effort? Uh, so a lot, lot of lot of different things that we can we can look to take on. Well, you, you mentioned uh, that this could could help with the matching dollars mm -hmm. uh, approach, and, and I think that's. Um, to have well, some money already uh, available mm -hmm. for uh, opportunities. Is, so I, I think it's um, smart. Uh, any, most any large project has multiple funding streams. So I, I think this gets us in that, uh, in that game. When I come back to you, I'll also give you, it's been a while to give you an update now that everything has sort of uh, worked its way through on where do we stand from a borrowing capacity? Because uh, I need to update those numbers with the new debt services for the courthouse and uh, probably do some reshooting of some of our estimates with interest rates higher. So um, I can give you an idea of what borrowing capacity would look like today. I mean, again, it's not. Probably oh. I'm going to guess probably about 10 million right now, yeah. uh, but uh, that's a guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that would probably put us right on the bear up there. Net. So. But it's above zero. Yes. So, <laughs> it's uh, definitely, you know, like I said, we all agreed to build some room and we didn't want to go all the yeah. way down to, to nothing. So, so now we can continue to grow that, but I can also give you an update mm -hmm. on where things stand. The interest rates are predicted to go down. Yeah. How quickly? Yeah. yeah. Good news, bad news. Yes. Good, good, good news is that you know gives us a chance to maybe borrow. Uh, bad news is we do, we're enjoying some nice exactly. returns yeah. right now on our balances. So uh, that's really helping our, yep. our bottom line. So yep. mm -hmm. I'd like to see it stay a little high for a while until we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, the other hand, from a housing perspective in the community, uh, and if those rates come down, it might uh, help. So yeah, always trade offs. <laughs> And I'll, I'll, and I'll keep examining uh, Chiro Juro in terms of finance. I'm, as you know, I geek out a little bit on the financing things. Mm -hmm. And so there's always different and creative financing structures. Yeah. You know, we've talked a little bit about private public partnerships yes. as well. I, I don't, I can't say I'm an expert in those areas, but they're, they're worth exploring. Yes. I know there's been questions about that particular financing strategy, but it's, it's still worth looking at. Yeah, so. I, I think that that is worth looking at. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge the fact that the sheriff is still online and um, uh, offer him a chance to contribute if, you, if, if he has anything to say. Everything's, everything's moving really slow on my computer for some reason, I apologize. Um, I appreciate that, uh, Chair Ogero. I just appreciate the conversation and, and I've said since day one, anything we can put towards it, I, I think, would send a very strong message. So I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I do appreciate the input and I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other comments on this topic, I think we are finished with this item. And we I'm looking forward to the even chart. Okay. I know you like the bar chart or the, the line chart, so I'll make sure to <laughs> put the belly in. Okay. <laughs> So thank you. It was a good discussion. We will move on to item 4.4, um, our calendar review, and invite Mora back up to join us. Thank you, commissioners. And um, hopefully this will just take a few minutes of your time. Um, the packet did include um, an overview of the calendar for the year, the board calendar as we know it. Uh, certainly uh, the board can call meetings or cancel meetings as they see fit. So this is just kind of an overview of what 2024 is looking like. Um, there were a few notations on the calendar uh, in red that I was looking for some board direction on because uh, resolution of them was not explicitly intuitive in terms of making a decision. 
Um, <clears throat> one thing I did want to ask about for January is typically the fourth Wednesday of every year in January, we have conducted an evening meeting of the, the taxing <laughs> jurisdictions to get an idea of what the other jurisdictions might be looking at in terms of bond measures and things like that. Um, <clears throat> last year, we our, our attendance for that was not particularly good. We, I think we had one or two people in person and one person online from the jurisdictions. And, um, so my question was whether the board, if feels we were to try to hold that meeting during a business day, whether or not we might um, get a little bit better participation from the other taxing jurisdictions and what your thoughts were there. I think that part of it is also just um, what people have on the docket um, and that thinking about what the other jurisdictions are, are um, going on. Um, when it's closer to a busy cycle of, in terms of raising funds from the other jurisdictions, then there's a lot of interest. When people have just finished a bond measure, there's much less interest. So we were in a dip in that cycle last year. Um, personally, I think that we would be better off polling some of the key entities, um, the, the cities, uh, the school districts, uh, and uh, to, to, and the community college, Lynn Benton Community College, to find out whether or not they would be available to attend a daytime meeting, whether it would be worthwhile. Um, I, I've, over the time I've been in office, seen kind of a, a slow decrease in attendance at that meeting, but um, yeah. Well, in, in a, um, several years back, there was a um, discussion of the uh, time of day uh, of the meeting. There was um, some kind of historical uh, reason, but I, I, I'm, I don't remember any um, very good reason for having it, you know, after hours. So uh, that could be another of the uh, questions we're trying to uh, keep this meeting going. I think it's uh, important. I, I think it, maybe it was last year, and uh, the LBCC person wasn't there, and but they were doing a, a bond measure in a couple months, and, and I'm on the budget committee, and I had heard something, but I wasn't really prepared to explain uh, in, in much detail, and, and so I, I think it's. Uh, there's good reasons for people to attend, just e even if their organiz organization isn't uh, doing anything imminent uh, as far as money measures uh, to, to know what, what else is out there. And uh, the, the ones that are coming right up, most people may know about, but, oh, we're thinking about two years from now or those kind of uh, longer term mm -hmm. and that I think is uh, a, a worthwhile um, discussion. And I think part of what uh, happened last year, um, I think the discussion you're referring to happened two years ago. And then last year when uh, Nick Kirk was with us, um, he actually telephoned all of the key jurisdictions and put together um, just an Excel spreadsheet of when uh, the different jurisdictions intended to have their next measures on the ballot. And so that also kind of, I think, eliminated the need to get, gather in person to do that same work. Um, and, I, I, and so that may have been part of the issue as well. Um, so, uh, but I think I, what I would recommend would be just using the email list that we have and, and reaching <clears throat> out and inquiring as to whether people felt it was worthwhile to, to hold the meeting um, at this time. And we could also ask whether or not they, what their projections are for uh, future funding measures. Um, or I guess, yeah. What should we meet or should, is it more worthwhile to do it virtually? You know, to, and just inquire and put together the tabular data. Okay. Okay, I can certainly take care of that. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to revisit March. Did we, in a conversation, identify March 16th as the date for the 
legislative wrap up breakfast that Saturday? No, no. Um, Zach is going to be checking with um, Speaker Rayfield and <coughs> Senator Gelser Bluen um, and their schedulers uh, to determine what's best, uh, to, to determine whether they would prefer to you know, hold the legislative breakfast on the same day as the League of Women Voters or whether or not we could get them that second Saturday of the month after session's over. Okay. And then the last couple of dates are far out, but we do try to look out and get these resolved early on. Um, and normally these are easier dates to resolve uh, in November, um, but given the way Thanksgiving holiday falls in November and uh, bumping up against the AOC conference in Eugene that you all attend, there's not a natural decision relative to um, the Tuesday board meeting, which would be the third Tuesday. So it is typically a business meeting. Um, based on what I know about the schedule of the AOC, the first event does typically occur is Monday evening with um, the women's leadership reception. And um, so my recommendation would be that we move the meeting to that morning, that Monday morning rather than Tuesday. Uh, but I wanted to get the board's that would be fine by me. Uh, it, that would have worked well this year. Uh, I would assume that AOC has a um, schedule. They do. It's. Um, I checked it online yesterday, um, and it, it's the same as usual. The meeting is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, and with the uh, evening event on Monday night and. Um, leadership of uh, activities Friday morning for those that are in leadership. So it seems like Monday is the yeah. that one on Monday. And then the other one is that uh, we have a, a city manager's meeting on the 26th, which is the weekend, which is the week of Thanksgiving. We've typically moved that either before or after, but um, you know, we could, we could push that to the first week of December, uh, pending the availability of the city managers. Um, well, bringing it back a week obviously puts us in conflict with the OC. So. so that first week of December, we looks like there's flexibility um, both on on Monday and on well Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we usually do it in the afternoon, though. Correct. Correct. It's usually a one o'clock meeting. No. Doesn't have to be, but that's been historically the timing. For Monday or Thursday look, look like they work. Okay, I will reach out to the area city managers to confirm um, that that would all work for everyone. So that resolves all the conflicts. We should have a relatively clean calendar, um, certainly subject to any cancellations or additions that might be necessary. Well, I certainly appreciate um, the forward look at the beginning of the year. Um, it's something that I've really wanted to do over the years, and we have never quite gotten there. So uh, this was very exciting to me, as minor as it is. Um, and the other uh, thing that it will allow us to do, too, is if we uh, start plugging vacations in, we can see when there um, are um, times when two of us might be absent and we might need to rearrange. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a great tool. Thank you. Okay, I'll make the adjustments and once we get uh, some of those externally driven dates uh, resolved, I'll get a final calendar. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. The only other, uh, I, let's see, in terms of February, Maura, uh -huh. just to go back that way uh, for a moment. Um, with the AOC dates and not having firm travel plans in yet, um, we may have some conflicts on the um, the return week. Yep, February thirteenth in particular. Yeah, February goal setting thirteenth is a goal setting meeting uh, that I think we've already moved to the fifteenth. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only other question is the the meeting with the uh, community development, natural areas, parks and events, and public works directors the, the following day. Uh, if for some reason our travel ends up. Um, on the 14th instead of the 13th, then we will um, have a little bit of a crunch. Hopefully we will- We will know by that, the tomorrow. By tomorrow. Um, the, the first conversation was he would prefer if we would stay till the 14th because 
then we're not competing with the Capitol Hill Day of yes. all the counties yes. that are trying to do it. So in, in past years, you've stayed an extra day to do the Capitol Hill visits in the morning, but to get us on a 6.30 flight back, mm -hmm. there's one direct to Portland, yep. uh, and it's at 6.30 at night that night, so we would try to run, run to the, go, yes, pack up, mm -hmm. go to the hill, and then go straight to the airport. Yep. That makes sense. Um, so there's a possibility that we need to move that meeting the morning of the 14th. Okay. Could move it Friday. Okay, thank you. Again, I really appreciate the forward looking um, planning. Um, next up, we have county administrator updates. So we're off to a busy year. Uh, there are three RFPs that we are uh, working on right now. Um, the sustainability plan, uh, which is really being run by community development that I'm reviewing, it's on my desk. Um, the other one is a facilities plan that will be spearheaded out of public works, which is something that uh, we really need uh, as we move forward. And as Rick was talking earlier about out our facilities, what is the state of each condition of the building, where our employees are, and whether there are opportunities as well. So that will be um, out shortly and most likely come back in April. We think it's <laughs> going to take that long to pick a consultant and, and go with it. The third um, RFP we'll be releasing and this is something I've talked to the chair uh, regarding is EDI and to help us explore future staffing and operational options. We, along with other jurisdictions and organizations are experiencing challenges while hiring and retaining <coughs> EDI staff at the organizational wide level. EDI, as most of us know, is equity, diversity, and inclusion. There are models and there's options that organizations employ and we need to find the approach that best fits our county's needs for various objectives. Um, this improved equity assessment, internal education and engagement, these EDI tools uh, like translation services, language access and public engagement and support. So presently the staff that addresses some of these uh, services is not in this position presently. And we're hoping that this RFP will help us address and answer those questions. I'm really looking forward to having a committee involved in this. Um, I know lots of folks like our human resource director and I actually look at April Holland in the room as well is something that we speak at on a regular basis, as well as the chair on um, how do we get to equity with all of our decisions and um, really looking forward to working at that and working closely with everyone in next year. Um, additionally, um, we are really looking at our health and human services in our organization as a whole. Um, we're looking at possible reorganization and some classifications that we have to look at. Um, that's a longer term process that we've had about four meetings with, with April and Lacey and, and really looking at our whole, um, holistically, how we move it forward. It is over half of our, almost our entire employees work in these fields. And we really wanna have the right direction moving forward. We're very, very committed to that. As we've spoken earlier, a lot of work is being done um, on our state and federal priorities. Um, as you know, we'll be traveling next month to Washington, D.C. We have the short session coming up. So we want to continue to stay laser focused on our priorities and talking to folks and really positioning ourselves uh, for success in grants and different items that help us uh, move forward. The money is out there. It's a question of us getting it. And I think that most of our department heads have seen the results of this. Um, and we want to continue to be uh, be central focus on that. So that are some things that are happening. I'm very excited that the assistant county administrator candidates, the um, job posting has come down. I have um, 
over 20 good resumes, over 91 people applied for this position. Um, as I spoke of earlier, uh, right now the county administrator has 17 direct reports. Um, we, do, we have a lot of different hats we wear. I'm really looking forward to seeing what type of partner will come in to really, as we've talked many times, and I look at uh, Commissioner Malone on landing some planes, landing some planes and getting some of these things um, accomplished. So I'm really um, going to be very focused by the end of the month to start interviews, bringing a group of candidates um, to the commissioners as well to look at, and hopefully we'll get a great partner to help us land those planes, as we say. Do you have a, a, a date in mind um, to have this person on board? Oh, gosh. Well, it depends, really. It, I think it's going to be about people's availability. Um, hopefully, it will be successful. I mean, I have a nice pool of folks that I can interview. Um, I have to look at their calendars and schedule. But, you know, I'm hoping um, it, that we would have someone in, in a position, at least down to two candidates by mid-February. Again, traveling to DC does, I lose a week there. Um, but again, we're gonna have a lot of pre-interviews and folks like that. So um, once again, it just closed. Um, I have shared with all three commissioners the, the final list that was um, presented to them. And, um, but I, it, it, it'll definitely be a, a, a big priority for this next month to bring in that support um, that the directors also desperately need more um, hands-on um, assistance to run their organizations and give them the tools they need to be successful. And um, so this is something that's um, th that's coming up. So, but I, I feel very uh, comfortable with the candidates right now and looking forward to talking to them. And the only other little piece we have is we launched the website last month. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's the first phase. We did identify from some community members and folks who had trouble finding some of our public meetings. So we did uh, get all folks together to talk about, uh, thankfully, um, led by our PIO and our public affairs team, IT, and a lot of folks at the table of people who are looking to access uh, future meetings. Uh, Vance, uh, our attorney, also has a major uh, role in this because as far as how long do you hold on to a video archives is different uh, statutorily uh, from each department. And once as you know, when body cameras were rolled out years ago, um, storing video is very, very expensive. So we wanna you know, take a good approach and come to you uh, the commit board of commissioners on a recommendation in the next couple months of how long we're going to be storing public meetings, um, and you'll definitely have a part of it. But we're just getting around that plan. Again, the launch was right before Christmas, um, so that's our first step looking at that as well. So that we'll be bringing something to you by uh, hopefully March or April of of what that will look like. And that's all my updates as of January 9th. So, question about the sustainability plan that you mentioned. That, that's not the sustainable materials management. Yes, it, it is. is. Okay. It's the same. So, you're looking at the selection of the contractor to do that work. That is right correct. Now. You're yes. reviewing that. Okay. And that was put on my desk Tuesday. Okay. So. I greatly look forward to hearing about the next steps there. Absolutely. Okay. So, next up is. Um, Commissioner updates. Commissioner Malone, do you want to start? Um, sure. Um, appreciate that. I mean, um, Zach here this morning just to uh, get us uh, foc focused on the upcoming short session and, and what's, uh, uh, I think, State of Washington just started their short session, only their short session is 60 days. Uh, <laughs> And I think part of the reason we're at 35 days was to um, sell it to the uh, voters that, uh, you know, we, we won't try to do too much uh, in the short session uh, budget and truing up the budget, which uh, happened uh, more with the emergency board and behind the scenes than, than uh, like that, that approach was less than uh, less than ideal, but uh, it's a real challenge to 
there's so so much momentum in, in, in Bill's, uh, oh, it almost made it through the long session that uh, ended last uh, last June and as well, okay, I'll see. I mean, it's like a relay race and, and you know, see if we can, um, even though it's complicated, uh, make some progress in the short session. And so it, uh, it really is less than an ideal vehicle for complicated uh, issues, but that's um, anytime you have an opportunity, I think uh, if you have something you're working on and you want to take advantage of it. So, uh, and, and I second the notion of it's nice having a um, pretty good idea of, of the calendar, um, um, really for the whole whole year. I was going to make a little joke. Well, now that we're done with twenty four, let's do twenty five. Let's keep keep this thing rolling. <laughs> but uh, it, it it is helpful. I mean, there'll be all kinds of changes, but at least uh, as of now, this is. Uh, this is our uh, schedule, and so it makes it a little easier to uh, plan around it. Uh, well, it, there was a, I do have some notes here somewhere. Um, uh, some good discussions at the AOC meeting uh, yesterday that. Uh, There's a lot of steering committee work and then goes to the legislative committee and uh, one item of uh, uh, alternative uh, wild, state wildfire funding uh, got seriously reversed from the steering committee. And uh, oh, anyway, uh, some of the uh, built-in uh, divisions within the group uh, showed up on that one, uh, but I think that's uh, <laughs> worth further uh, attention. Uh, it's uh, uh, ODF's funding is a little, little bit like ODOT's funding, and, and it's... Uh, uh, not very sustainable, and uh, when you have a $10 million fire or a $20 million fire, and well, gee, that wasn't really in the budget um, uh, because you don't know what uh, what's coming. So uh, I, I think it's uh, a worthwhile discussion to say, Wildfires affect everybody in the state. Everybody in the state um, should put something into the uh, fund to uh, fight wildfires. But there's uh, kind of anti-government folks in AOC <laughs> that um, uh, didn't like that approach. They weren't at the steering committee, but uh, were at the legislative uh, meeting yesterday. So, and I would guess at uh, February AOC, they'll, there'll be more attendance at the steering committee. Mm -hmm. so that, uh, at the steering committee, the vote was 16 to four to uh, proceed. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, supporting Elizabeth Steiner, so uh, uh, well thought out proposal and something that's a little different that the uh, counties were were at the table uh, and, and not just after uh, something had been de developed, but uh, to help uh, develop the the program. Uh, I think that that's that, that's what uh, 
what I have. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I've mentioned most of what I've been doing, um, focused again on the health and human services and public safety agenda, uh, as well as working with um, our coordinated regional office staff on flexible spending, a uh, flexible subsidy pool. Um, flexible what? Um, flexible subsidy pool, the, the concept that we're looking at for the House Bill 2019 funds um, that was presented to us last month at um, our health services meeting. Um, the, it, we're just looking at partnerships and um, especially when it comes to uh, potential partnerships with Samaritan and with the um, coordinated care organization and potentially with Oregon State University to be able to help us with an evaluation piece of that um, new program so that we can successfully say that what we are piloting is making a difference in terms of rehousing people um, and not just in the near term, but uh, keeping people in housing um, because the state is also looking at this type of approach. Um, so we're working again with all partners, including the funder to establish the a pilot and then a program that will persist for us in the long term and um, improve our outcomes for housing people that have been unhoused. Um, so I, I've had a couple of conversations about that um, with um, staff and with external partners and I uh, have one more coming up with um, our colleagues at the uh, IHNCCO and Samaritan Health Systems. Um, and aside from that, um, uh, I'm expecting to attend the Martin Luther King Day Peace Breakfast on campus um, this next week. Uh, and um, also, um, have a couple of other um, Samaritan related meetings on the calendar. Um, but then the main thing for me is that I'm taking off. Um, oh, and the, uh, actually, backwards for a moment. Um, out in LC on the evening of the 17th. Um, and we'll be meeting with uh, staff just to clarify roles um, uh, and communication uh, strategies with our LC community um, before that meeting so that I can speak confidently about how we intend to uh, work with the community moving forward. Um, and then I'm as after our tour um, of the new Oak Creek Valley um, emergency evacuation route um, next on Wednesday, the 24th, I will be taking off on vacation. Um, and I'm going to be gone for about a week and a half um, to get some sunshine and uh, then be back for about a week and then head off to Washington, DC. So yeah, that should <coughs> wrap it up. Uh, I know that Commissioner Wise is on her way back, um, but in her absence, I think that we are uh, basically done with the core part of our meeting, unless there is any other business before the board. I know we have an executive session coming up, and so we will get that going. Um, I, hopefully with Commissioner Wise present uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. With that, the um, we will stand in recess until we reconvene in executive session under ORS 192.6602E, negotiations for property transactions. <laughs>